call our board meeting to order. Um, one of our directors is not present, uh, Rochelle, and uh, so otherwise the four of us are here. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, that's the roll call. We have one public hearing on declaration of water shortage stage. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna start off with a presentation, short presentation here. Oops. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, oh, that works. Okay. Well, that's weird. So I'd like to give a little bit of background on the district's water shortage contingency plan, and that's really our rule book for determining whether to declare water supply shortage and what level of curtailment goes along with that and also what actions that are needed to achieve those curtailment targets. Our plan is included as attachment one to the memo tonight, um, but I just wanna give a quick run through of how it works. And the purpose of it is to conserve available water supply and to protect and preserve public health, welfare and safety during short and long-term water supply shortages. It's a key component of our five-year urban water management plan submittal. And so it was last updated in 2016 as part of our 2015 urban plan. Um, every year following the end of the water year on March 31st, we take a look at the plan and um, uh, in relation to the triggers and uh, ask the board to um, make a declaration about a shortage stage if, if one is needed. So the water supply shortage, or yeah, water shortage contingency plan has um, a couple uh, shortage types and some trigger conditions, and we're really focusing on the items that are that are highlighted. So for shortage types, we're looking at long term, due to drought, um, contamination, or failure of critical infrastructure, and uh, long term due to groundwater overdraft. And then the trigger conditions that we're looking at tonight are really number two and three. So presence of a groundwater emergency, which is indicative of the condition or the health of our groundwater basin and our five year rainfall totals. Um, those are the current water year. So October 1st through March 31st. And then the four prior full years, October 1st through September 30th. And this uh, plan has basically five supply shortage stages. We are always in a stage zero at a minimum, which is our baseline water conservation and water waste uh, enforcement. So you can see there that the curtailment uh, levels range from 5% up to 50%, and those are compared to a 2013 baseline. That was our pre, kind of pre-drought, uh, statewide drought year. This gives a little glimpse into where we've been, and you can see that in the last six years, we've been in some short, some sort of shortage. It's a tongue twister. Um, starting in 2012, and the last four years, we've been in a stage three with a 25% curtailment target, and stage three rates in the last year as well. So um, the rates, Emergency rates are needed to account for the decrease in the consumption and revenue associated with the, each stage and curtailment target. And they're also needed to um, cover the costs of implementing the actions to achieve those curtailment levels. At a minimum, the district has to cover its fixed operating costs, which remain the same for the most part, whether we're, we're pumping at 2013 levels or current levels now, which are uh, a lot less. So the trigger conditions that we're looking at, um, the first is the health of the basin. And in 2014, um, in response to the overdraft that we've had and the uh, seawater intrusion, the board declared a groundwater emergency. Um, since that time, the basin's been designated as critically overdrafted by the State Department of Water Resources. Um, we recently conducted uh, the SkyTim study, which um, was reported on at the last board meeting, as well as one of the recent MGA meetings. And that study shows that 
we have seawater not only at, at both ends of the service area, which we knew about on shore, but it's very close to the shore in between those two points. We, um, we have had some good news in that the big reductions in pumping and the conservation that our customers have, have done since 2013 has resulted in the water levels in uh, some of the wells improving, but we are still uh, seeing a number of wells that are still below protective elevations. So that's an upshot of, of all the water saving. The uh, other trigger condition that we are focusing on is the five-year rainfall totals, and those are tied to predicted groundwater recharge. Um, we look at five years because rain falling in one year may take many to several years to reach down into the aquifer levels from which we're pumping, which are pretty deep. And when we look at those alone, we, we land in a stage two, which is um, what we were thinking when we came to the board last month with, a, with an update. Um, so nothing uh, changed there. This shows the five-year rainfall totals, and so you can see the current year, um, we've gotten 16.17 inches and um, significantly below average, and uh, the average there is represented by that dotted line. And so we take those five year, um, the prior four full years, and we build on that looking at the current rainfall year. And so this chart shows what we really needed to um, uh, come out of a, a stage three. I'm gonna graphically show this, it's a little easier to follow. So you can see here, this is the current year building on the four prior years and um, rainfall below the blue line is indicative of a stage three based on rainfall alone. Rainfall below the red line is indicative of a stage two and the green line represents, um, if you exceed that, you, you're um, in a stage one. So you can see there that we, we had a really low rainfall up until, oops, going back here till February, um, early March is when we really crossed the line between a three and to a two, and we never exceeded the red line, so we're, um, we're about an inch and a half, I think, short of, of that red line. In, I guess, a, a snapshot here, a summary, um, Based on the groundwater emergency trigger condition, there's a basis for the board to declare a continued stage three with a 25% curtailment. And um, based on the five-year rainfall trigger condition, there's a basis for declaring a stage two with a 15% curtailment. So that leaves with the uh, possible board actions for tonight, and I'm gonna stop there. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> I do have a question. Please do. Go ahead. Um, I just, I know these were based on the previous um, criteria, and we did the best we could, and it was better than based on, <laughs> mm -hmm. on just surface water conditions, but when will we be reevaluating that criteria for future years? I just brought that up, and then and in that, is there a way to consider not just amount of rainfall, but temperature and pattern of rainfall and estimation of recharge. Yeah, so we, I know that came up last year and maybe even the year before and um, we were waiting on the groundwater model to be okay. completed. That, that's really a key part in uh, doing something different than what we already have and reevaluating those trigger conditions. And so, um, you know, we, we've talked about that and how could we structure it differently. We could look at well levels, protective well levels. Um, so I think um, given that it'll need to be updated again um, for the 2020 urban plan in 2021, we could wait until then or once the model is fully developed, we could reevaluate that and okay. if you want us to. Okay. Yeah, protective levels probably make the most sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I think what, um, Pismo Beach area does. They they have a, a plan that's based on well levels, so we could take a look at their plan and. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
Any other questions? Carla? Yeah, I wanted to, well, in the past, it seemed as if uh, rainfall was the primary criterion for setting these stages, uh, triggers, I guess you'd call them. And I just was wondering, uh, we've had uh, Dr. Daniels' research, the hydrogeology of this entire basin research, and we have had uh, the models on the Stanford, you know, the Stanford climate change models, and so we know a lot more about the evapotranspiration, you know, and how that's going to change, and I, I really think we need to take all of those factors into uh, making a decision on tonight, and I think we, the last time this came up, we did have a, uh, I think, on the basis of that, I proposed a stage four, actually, even, you know, there was a bare justification for that, according to rainfall. But I still think the threat is there, and I'm not tonight promo promoting or proposing getting extreme, but I, would, I think it's, we still have a concerning uh, issue with the other criteria that we, you just discussed. So mm -hmm. I'd just like to, as soon, I think we should do a complete reevaluation as soon as we have more solid information. Mm -hmm. I had one question myself. Uh, it was the uh, the stages since 2012. That diagram that you had up, that one there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know we have these water use reduction targets, but what is what are, what is this reduction against? For example, it could be against the previous year. It could be against. I mean, and if you if you do it against the previous year, if you start off with 100 gallons, by now you'd be down to 19 gallons because it's continually reducing yeah. more and more and more and more. Uh, so Since 20, um, 2013, again, is our, our baseline year, and that was pre-drought. Um, I don't have any production charts going back that far. I think they're somewhere else in the packet. But um, So we're really comparing ourselves against our 2013 production, mm -hmm. and we're, I believe we're currently 22% below our 2013. So we're not actually asking our customers to do a to lot. To do much more and. Almost um, hold the line, but maybe a little bit more. Yeah, and we tied that 25% to a 50 gallon per person per day uh, usage guideline to give people some something to aim for and something realistic that they can work with. And we've seen it come back up to about 55 GPCD, so we're, we're still in a good spot. People are still saving a lot of water, but it is creeping back up. Okay. We should probably put that detail in the ump when we redo it. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. What the goal really is. Yep. And it might change over time. Okay. It, the baseline might might shift. Okay. Well, yeah, it appeared that we were going to go right past the, the 50 gallons per person per day at some point, and then it stopped in that great year of rainfall last year. Yeah, that was, uh, it was 50, over 50 inches of rainfall last year. Since this is a public hearing, I'll open the public hearing. Anyone wish to address us on this item? This is the time. Good evening. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in Aptos, and I'm a customer of Pure Source. I depend on the Purisma Aquifer for my family's drinking water too. I want to thank you for the report and I want to urge your board to be conservative in what you do tonight in determining what stage of water curtailment that you um, approve. I just want to remind you that, and I don't have to do this, I know, but um, even Governor Brown's last year proclaiming that the drought was over caused all of the area's water usage to go up an average of 12%. And with the rains that we had last winter, that didn't help. And um, now with the article in Sunday's Sentinel <laughs> saying that the groundwater levels have risen to historic uh, highs in some areas, I think it's gonna be a, a tricky balance of really educating the public about what uh, the groundwater overdraft issues are and that uh, conservation is good and must be um, held steady. 
So I think to um, relax your stage of curtailment will send a message to the public that they don't have to worry so much anymore and usage will go up further. I want to um, just point out that in, um, well, first of all, in, in Ms. Flock's report, it didn't talk about the Ramble study and um, that it was it really just a snapshot of the seawater uh, freshwater interface location. But I also want to point out that in 2014, Dr. Rosemary Knight's work from Stanford University was another snapshot from an earlier time, and it has been um, confusing to me why her snapshot and the Rambo snapshot are not really being incorporated into the hydrometrics theoretical model uh, to give us a better idea of how things are moving one way or the other. And I also want to um, point out that in um, Sunday's article, um, there was no mention of the water a demand offset program that your district has been very aggressive and uh, it pr in maintaining and that that has been your answer to continually um, approving more s supply and more demand on the, the overdrafted aquifer, the Aptos Village project, for example, being a huge increase. And um, so those are my comments, and again, I just want to urge you to be conservative. I know you will be very thoughtful in what you do, and please uh, encourage people to continue conserving. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Valerie Webb, and I live in Capitola. And I just have a couple questions. Uh, first of all, do I'm gathering that you folks set the rules for when we go into different stages? It's not a statewide mandate that we're following. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that was something I didn't know. Another question I had reading over the packet is what I'm in all these meetings. I've never caught what is the budget year you folks run on? What's the fiscal year here? July. July one. July one. Okay, so I was. One of my concerns was if you did happen to go to a stage two, what would happen to the budget? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because I know that that's always a concern and money doesn't grow on trees for anybody. So I appreciate, as well as I can, you guys know so much more than I do, but the tension that you're working under of constantly, not wanting to constantly berate people, save, 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 but also having a greater awareness than probably anybody else in the community of the dangers that we are facing. Um, I, I feel like there's gonna be a tension when you announce whatever you do. I, I think if I was a betting woman, I would bet that you're gonna stay in a stage three. But I think there will be a tension because I think for most of us who don't know as much, we just look at rainfall and go, well, rainfall says stage two. Mm -hmm. What do we do? And I, so I think the tension and my encouragement for you guys, because I do care and I think, I agree with Becky, we should probably be conservative because this is a big, a big old problem on our hands. Um, but I think I would encourage you to really work on the reach out to the community part because it's starting to feel like, you know, none of us controls the rain, but it is starting to feel a little bit like, you know, not even when we get the rain are we gonna give you guys a break because now we're depending on the stage three money and, you know, it's just not gonna work out for you, which can be demoralizing, we know, for people you know, they'll just go, well, you know, I've got money, screw it, I'll just, I'll use the water and pay the rates and not care anymore. So my encouragement will be on that, especially if you do decide to stay in a stage three to really work to reach out because we need everybody on our side sure. if this is gonna come out well and future generations are gonna get to live here. So thank you guys very much, you do a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Hello, you all. Uh, my name is Sam Farrington. I live in Rio Del Mar. I just wanted to make a few comments on looking for the new source of water. I'm so glad to see progress. Um, the idea of the exchange with Santa Cruz sounds me, extremely me. good to me. If Santa Cruz will play play fair with everybody, that's. Mm -hmm. might be a question. Um, 
I think the uh, seawater from Moss Landing, I would question that. Uh, it's very complex seawater conversion. I did a uh, project at Moss Landing 50 years ago doing a seawater evaporator and trying to get that online and reliable. It was not an easy task. We didn't have the technology then that we do now. So I would think very seriously about that. Also, with the seawater, you have to be careful because whales poop in the ocean, <laughs> and we don't want that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would say is that uh, the uh, <clears throat> reprocessed water, I think, is really a good way to go. And SoCal Creek Water District can operate and control that themselves without others interfering and wanting their share back and forth. And also, I'm very glad to see that the conservation program is working. The last little flyer that came out with the billing uh, indicated that it was doing very well. And uh, you have another minute. Does that give, give me minute. one minute? One, one more minute. minute. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I won't ask for anybody else's time. I'll try and uh, get this short and sweet. And I think SoCal Creek Water District is doing a very good job, and I'm very pleased to be connected to it. And uh, so very, very much in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Um, anyone else? Anyone else wish to speak to us? So I'll move we close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Okay. Um, well, I didn't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. um, the presentation I thought was very clear. And I could see how the public would be confused with the rainfall criteria being different than the other criteria. Um, but to me, it, it all boils down to the most important piece of information that we've received since I've been on the board, which is 15 years, is the location of the freshwater seawater interface. Is it far offshore? In which case we have plenty of time before we have to uh, build up the water levels onshore to keep it off, or is it close to shore? And it's very close to shore. As a matter of fact, we don't even know if just exactly where it is. It could be a foot offshore. It could be a few hundred feet offshore, but we know it's not much farther offshore than that. So to me, because of that, I think we want to keep with a, a stage three because it, it it, the, me the message is, is that uh, we still do need to conserve to protect ourselves from seawater intrusion. And another couple comments is that, are that um, this rainfall was a, a vast improvement to look at an average rainfall or cumulative rainfall over many years or up to five years. <clears throat> But that's not exact because you can have the same rainfall and different amounts of water going into the aquifer recharging it. Mm -hmm. So that's a potential improvement if we were going to stick with rainfall. I agree that, that since seawater intrusion is what we're trying to fight, that uh, a criteria that incorporates what our water levels are near the coast would, would, would make sense. And uh, I did read the article in the Sentinel, and I thought it was overall very good. Um, it was a little, um, it was clear to me, but I'm not sure it was clear to everyone that the reason, there are multiple reasons for the water levels going up, but one of the key reasons, in addition to the, the fact that there's less usage, 
is that, and I, I think, uh, Ron, you were quoted on this, is that allowed us to move our pumping away from the coast. So it allowed the, the wells to recover near the coast. So in a way, it's an artificial um, increase in water levels. So that, that it doesn't reassure me. So. Is that a motion? I'll, I'll make the motion, yeah. <laughs> I'll second it then. Okay. <laughs> well, and actually, there's several motions in his roll call, right? Yeah. Yes, but it, it's yeah. for the resolution and the declare so, stage so three, I think you were saying. Yeah. So the, the, f the first, there's um, perhaps what you should do it is what? Should we do the motions that are just yay or nay first and then do the roll call motion? Yeah, as you wish, that, that would be fine. Those, those are simple. So, uh, so I'll, I'll make the first three motion, um, the, the third motion to declare a, a water sh a shortage stage in curtailment target and adopt emergency rates for, for stage, stage three. Three, okay, I'll second. Um, as discussion, I'd like to mention a little bit of what we've already had discussed or questioned. Um, some some references have been made to the newspaper article. And could we have up that five-year rainfall graph? As, as some of you probably know, that about four or five years ago, we did do a, a groundwater model. It was uh, PRMS, and that allowed us to determine you know, partly where our protective levels were. And uh, it's interesting, it showed very directly that the difference between recharge, and that is a better way to know what's happening to us than just rainfall, the difference is not linear. So if you double the rainfall, you don't double the recharge. In fact, it's more like three or four times. So when you get rainfall, it gets, as it, as it increases, the recharge increases dramatically upwards, and more so the other way. And in fact, as you can see, we have about 30 inches of, on average of our rainfall. But when it gets down below 20 inches, we get essentially zero recharge. So it means this, this year, 16.7, we essentially have gotten zero recharge because we just didn't get enough rainfall to overcome a lot of the other losses. And a lot of folks don't realize 67% of the rainfall we get on average evaporates. And that's you know, the rain hitting trees and just evaporating right off the trees and never hitting the ground. You probably walked under a tree during a rainstorm and noticed it's dry under the tree, but it's wet outside. And you probably thought, well, the rain just hasn't gotten down here yet. But no, it never gets down there because much of it that hits the tree or bush or even grass leaves evaporates and never is seen. So most of the rainfall we get here evaporates for, for that way and other ways. And, uh, and that you can tell via this model we have. And that would be a good way to do this. It's also sensitive to temperature. Um, so every time the temperature goes up a degree, evaporation increases by 4%. So instead of 66%, it gets to 70% if it's only just one degree warmer. And uh, so, you know, with climate change and so forth, that could be, in the future, a very important part of our lossage. So you know, we have a, and that same PRMS is being used in our brand new groundwater model. So we'll be able to continue that. And, and actually, you know, we could run that every year and tell us with the rainfall we get and the patterns we get, and the pattern is important too. For example, if you had 36 inches of rain um, fall on average, but one year it was every day you get a tenth of an inch, that would be just enough to get the ground wet and it would all evaporate. And it means you would get zero recharge even though it would be well above average. And similarly, if you got all 36 inches in one day of the year, you'd have a horrendous you know, storm going out to, to the water, and uh, it would all come down, and most of, most of it wouldn't get into the ground because the ground only has a capacity to take in a, a certain amount, and the rest just runs off. So you get huge runoff, great floods, and you wouldn't get much recharge. And so the pattern is important too, and this model would tell us all those things. So that would be a good way to do that in the future. Um, so, enough for I wanted to say, say one thing to, yeah. uh, just one last, uh, to uh, you're correct, everyone who mentioned the, the Ramble model on the seawater, uh, freshwater interface, the science is in on that. We do know that, and the, our, the district recently set up in the previous, our previous meeting room, 
an educational center for anyone who doesn't really know about that yet. And it will be updated to reflect the results of that current study. And I'd urge everyone who, uh, to talk about it and tell people to go check that out because it is part of the outreach to let people know what's happening with the groundwater. And so it will be, uh, it is providing for updates. So it's, it's very important to let other people know if you know, if you mm. heard some things and not rely entirely always on Santa Cruz Sentinel. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Check with the district occasionally too. Yeah, I was going to also mention you. Know, why? Why do the groundwater levels seem better this year compared to the past? And it's because of that 51.11 yeah. inches. Mm -hmm. So you think, okay, well that's like 60% uh, higher than at, than normal, but that because of this nonlinear relationship means it was at least double the amount of recharge we get in an average year, maybe you know, two and a half times. So that alone could cause the groundwater levels to come up because you're getting so much extra recharge. And even though the water molecules take a long time to get from the surface down to you know, where we actually are pumping, the pressure, which is what we mo move and measure, uh, that happens very quickly. That happens within you know, a matter of a few days. So that's what, what we're actually seeing is that all that rainfall we got, much of it went into the ground, and that extra amount added to the ground showed up at our pumping wells quite quickly. And the scary thing is that when you get a, a year like this, it means that uh, fairly quickly you're going to see the fact that we didn't get much recharge this year. So, Okay. Anything else? Well, there's one more motion. So and we need to vote on the first one. I know. But you want to roll. Go ahead. No. Okay. Okay. So we have some motions and a second on that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And there's one more motion that requires a roll call. Yes. Right. You want to make that? Sure. Mm -hmm. I'll that we adopt the re re repeal the old resolution, adopt the new resolution with the stage three. Okay. I'll second that. Roll call, please. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Dan? Yes. Okay, I think we're done with this. Um, we now have the consent agenda. If there's anything directors or the public would like to remove from the consent agenda. I do. Pardon? I do have two things. Okay. I'd like to talk about the production reports 3.4. Okay. And I need to remove 3.3 because I'm going to abstain on that, recuse myself. Okay. Anything 3 .3? else? 3.3. 3.3 and 3.4 pulled. Anything else? Anybody? No. No, I wanted to pull. The production reports also. Okay. Anyone in the public? Okay. Then uh, I'll move approval of the remaining consent agenda items. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay. Three three. I'm just going to recuse myself from this because there's an item with the U.S. Geological Survey. On ah. It. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion that we do the. That uh, item, the uh, March warrants. Pay our bills. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll second that. Okay, that's a good idea. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And abstain. Recuse yourself. Recuse myself. Okay. So that's that one. Three, four production reports. Did you want to start? Oh, I just wanted to note uh, that <laughs> uh, the increase the. The increase in water demand is creeping up just as we previously discussed, and it's all <coughs> in the production report. Uh, it's not s serious, but if it kept along on that trend, then we'd be getting into uh, going back to the old water demand uh, that levels that we had that started to get <coughs> us into this problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, I wanted to ask some questions about the figure on page 29 of 144, the mm -hmm. yep. residential consumption and production compared to 2013. So the, the first question I had was about, there's a note saying production includes imports and excludes exports. So that would be, say, if there's an emergency that occurs where we export water to Santa Cruz or or central or someplace, then it, that's not included in here? 
Um, be pretty minor, but I just, just right. That's right. The numbers um, that are included in here are the ones that we report monthly to the state, and so it's kind of a, a snapshot of each system. So if we exported water to Santa Cruz, then they would have had to include that as part of their um, supply. Gotcha. So it so wouldn't be so it wouldn't be counted so twice. So it's a zero sum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the the other question I had was. The residential consumption, uh, so it's gallons per capita per day. So is that just taken by the entire water usage or the entire production divided by the, the number of people or does it separate out businesses from Yes, it separates out businesses and also unaccounted for water and water losses and um, water that the district uses, so. Okay. Well, it's a very interesting graph, and it uh, it's it's really startling on on just how low the water usage is per capita, especially in the winter months. Mm -hmm. You know th that people are doing a lot. Mm -hmm. I think it's also okay. interesting that the winter months haven't gone up nearly as fast as the summer months have gone up. Right. Well, you have to keep in mind, like, even last year, summer started fairly early in the season compared to, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, say, or something that, you know, when the rain would, you know, rain and fog would continue until actual summer. Um, and this year was headed the same way, you know, very dry, and then we've had this late winter, mm -hmm. well, spring rains. But it, it does clearly show that uh, 2000, the winter of 2017, 18, or 18 it would be fall winter, is different than 16 and 17, and, it, and that there has been an increase where the per capita has gone from somewhere in the range of 40 gallons per, per person per day to up more like 45. So people mm -hmm. are using more water, mm -hmm. and it could it could partly be because of of uh, temperatures. Yeah, I, I like the re I like the figure. Yeah. Anything else we want to say or about this? I don't think this is an item we need to approve. It's just for information only. So that being done, um, we can just move on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Okay, sure. Thank you, um, Becky Steinbrenner. I was a little confused, I guess, by the consent agenda. I thought uh, the chairman's question to the public was, do you want anything pulled off of this? I didn't realize that that was also the time to comment on the consent agenda. Um, can I make a brief comment on an item in the consent agenda? Okay, but in the future, you have to pull it in order to talk about it. That's same with us. Yeah. Right. Okay. I didn't understand that. I'm sorry, and yeah. thank you for clarifying it's that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's confusing. But yeah. Um, I I just want to uh, make a comment on the um, uh, where are the minutes from last meeting? That usually they are here, and also um, on the March. Not prepared yet? They'll okay. be they'll be on the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And on the warrants. Um, I just want to again publicly point out that um, I mean the total for the Pure Water SoCal project is almost $95,000 and that's a lot of money to spend when your EIR is not even in and, and you, again the board is saying you haven't made up your mind what you're going to do. I also want to um, point out that in the warrants, there's a payment to John Madonna Construction, who was the county, Santa Cruz County Public Works contractor for the Aptos Village area road improvements. And I see here uh, almost $38,000 that the district has paid to that contractor. That on top of the $41,000 that was paid out last time, the warrant. So that's, you know, a lot of money, $79,000 for road improvements in the Aptos Village project 
that are being funded by ratepayers, and that really should have been funded by the developers under their um, the fees, developer fees covering the impacts of all of their development. And finally, um, I, I do have a question, not finally, but I have a question about um, the s task one assessment of steady state assumptions for hydrometrics for $13,872. That's not very um, clear to the public what that means. So some explanation of that would be very helpful. MNS Engineering looks like it's getting a lot of money also for the granite way well, which I have observed there are a couple of new buckets kind of hidden behind the pipes there, so I'm watching that. And sadly and finally, I want to say that I did see the redwood trees being taken down at your district office today, and I'm assuming that's what the $5,000 tree trimming to Lewis Tree Service was for. I was sad to see them go. Thank you. So are we. It was unfortunate. Okay. Um, well, I, I can mention the uh, the thing about the, the baseline. That's part of the groundwater model. So you always look at a model and say, okay, what happens if nothing changes? And that's the baseline. And you want, would like to say, okay, what happens if you have climate change? Okay, that's not a, that's something over and above the baseline. What happens if we bring in water from Santa Cruz, that's above the baseline. So, you know, we're looking at all these various changes. If this changes, what happens? If that changes, what happens? And they're all relative to doing nothing, which is the baseline. So that's what that's all about. And if you like, I can comment on the other two items. Sure. Uh, the paving, that's a right-of-way issue. That's our responsibility to, pave, to pay for that in Aptos Village. And the uh, funding toward the Pure Water Soquel, that should be um, all covered under the, or mostly covered under the grant funding, the over $2 million, or $2 million that we've been awarded. So it doesn't come out of the customer's pocket. All right. So we move on to the oral communications. This is items not on tonight's agenda. Anyone wish to address us on that? My name's Robert Lay, I live in Aptos. I've been doing some uh, deep data diving and I'm here to try and convince you that there's enough water available right now and hopefully uh, to convince you to think of the San Lorenzo River as its English translation, the St. Lawrence River because that's kind of how much water is available. <clears throat> I heard about flows in the river uh, from Jerry Paul, as a matter of fact, and how during high flow times a lot of water went out to sea. So I evaluated the flows over the last 50 years at the Felton Diversion, and that's the top box on page one that you have in front of you. Um, you can work through it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. All it was was what can we get with one Ranny collector at 88 cubic feet per second or more flow, and that's what's in that box over the last 50 years and 20 years. As you know, flow graphs from the San Lorenzo show huge peaks and huge steep fall-offs. So there are lots of very big days. Andy Fisher at UCSC tells us that that's gonna get worse, that the flows are gonna get higher and maybe even steeper as the storms become more concentrated but larger. So my thought was maybe some of that could be harvested, particularly if the spikes are gonna get bigger, maybe uh, we could get a lot of water out of there. So what? I hear you saying is, well, that's nice, but this is a dry year, right? So how about 2018, water year 2018? Rainfall's about half of normal. Water restrictions are on the table for everybody. So what do the data show for this year? If you turn to page two, which is the flip side of what I gave you, you'll see that I, I 
took the San Lorenzo River flows, which is the big graph you see on the first page. Those are all up to date as of yesterday. We're gonna harvest only when flows remain over 39 cubic feet per second. We're gonna harvest at 20 million gallons a day with one collector or 40 million gallons a day with two collectors. The other stuff on there shows you other harvest rates and so forth. Already this year, you could have harvested 1.38 million gallons of water already in a, in a low rainfall year. I see Dr. Daniel shaking his head no. So even in a relatively dry year, which this is, the St. Lawrence can easily supply all of your needs. Um, any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I'll leave you with a little teaser number, which is 4.892. If you wanna know what that is, let me know. What, comments? Uh, yeah, um, the thing that everyone who looks at the St. Lawrence uh, River uh, for, forgets to include is water rights. We have no water rights to the, that river, so we can't take a drop out of it. Correct, no, but Santa the, Cruz can. They can take it for themselves. Yes, Fine. and they can then give you North Coast water since it's fungible. Well, well, we, we do have an agreement with them yep, that they understand. can give us, uh, and that's the 300 acre feet. I understand, I'm just saying the water's there. Yes, and. Right, so I mean it needs to come from them, so hopefully you've given this data to them. Right. But to give, you, to give you an idea of the situation, they have a water, it would require water rights change to be able to give us any water out of that or the lock. And they have had a water rights application into the state board for 12 years now. They're gonna have to solve the fish problem first, they're gonna have to do an EIR, then they're gonna have to go to the state board and get a water rights change. And uh, until they manage to get all that stuff done, we can't take any of it. And uh, who, kn who knows how long it'll take. Um, that's one of the things that we're looking at with the city, um, but it hasn't happened yet, and who knows when it'll happen. Uh, it's, it's complicated, and we are proceeding. We've spent several hundred thousand already on the taking the, three, the North Coast water because their, their water is surface water. Our pipes have never seen surface water, and we don't want the thing to happen that happened to Flint, Michigan which is you put a new source of water in there and that causes stuff that's in the pipes and so forth to become uh, um, moving and it ends up in Toxic. the water supply. And so we are still investigating that. We're hoping uh, to get a report out of that probably next month and if that's all good, then we'll be ready next winter to start taking that. So that's the situation. Um, I, know, I know there's a lot of potential there, but until those uh, those improvements get made, uh, we can't take it any of it. So we'll thank see. You. Thank you for putting the time in and yeah. very clear presentation. Right. And I, I second what uh, President Daniels says is that Santa Cruz is the gatekeeper. Yeah. And, we, and once it's available, we're interested because Definitely. Um, um, you know, the, the 300 acre feet uh, we're getting, they're, they're they're charging us what, like double the cost of pumping out of the ground, but that's cheaper than any other source. And so it behooves us to take it. And so if it was there and it was available today, that's what we would take because it'd be cheaper and easier. And if it was safe. And safe, yeah, right. on the terms we, we have, right. I'd but like to also add that the Santa Cruz City itself is, views this as a more complex problem than this too. They are actively modeling, they've been working on this thing themselves too because they really need to find a solution to their their water shortages that occur in the surface water and they have too much surface water and then they are they find they find themselves in a drought situation and they need to bank some water so they they're motivated but they, the fact that it hasn't happened yeah it yet is because they find it a very complex modeling problem themselves so uh, in fact, in a few minutes, I'm going to report on their meeting they had Tuesday night on that. And another place to present this is the Mid-County Groundwater Agency. Yeah. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I really appreciate Mr. Lay's very diligent and thorough work, too. And I really appreciate that the district has taken the initiative and foresight to do the the bench test for the pipe loops, 
pipe studies and would also encourage the district to go ahead with the closed system study and not wait for the results of the bench test. Again, being conservative because um, why wait? <laughs> let's, let's get this moving. Um, the, the district's uh, claim is that you're, you're looking for uh, the most timely uh, solution to finding a supplemental source, and I also agree with Mr. Lay that the North Coast Streams is really a source that needs to be looked at more carefully. And, and again, I want to thank you for your conservative um, efforts to, to really look at the pipe uh, corrosion incompatibilities. I would like you to also look at increasing the size of the inner tie that already exists between uh, Soquel Creek Water District and the city of Santa Cruz. Increasing the size of that inner tie to at, at least 3 million gallons per day, 6 million gallons per day would be better so that you could take advantage of these flashy storms that are predicted to come in, a, in with the climate change models that we're all seeing. I would also like you to encourage, uh, like to encourage you to, I know you already buy water from Central Water District, but they are in a superb area for groundwater recharge, according to Dr. Uh, Andy Fisher's work, and they have water that they are happy to sell you, and it's a lot cheaper than what you produce it for. And I know the inner tie already exists there too. Um, SB 623 is hurtling along, and everyone agrees that the real intent of that is to get money for consolidation. I want to think, I want to ask you to consider consolidation with Santa Cruz City. I'm seeing that happen at the LAFCO meetings between the fire agencies. If your district consolidated with Santa Cruz City, the water rights issue of the San Lorenzo River would be a moot point. No, it wouldn't. As I understand it, it would, but I would be happy to talk with you more. And um, f I also, in closing, want to um, just point out that I did send all of the board members, and I thought Ms. Reese, uh, communication from Dr. Rosemary Knight uh, about the 3D video of her SkyTem work in the marina area and it is fabulous, and I want to encourage the district to use that technology for the Rambo work. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Thomas Dumba, and I live in Aptos and Great Bear. Uh, some time ago, there was a piece in uh, your publication, What's on Tap, about uh, two transparency awards that you received. When trying to find proof of the water, uh, the, the water saving at the village project, you have signs all around the fence there that says that this project has saved water in the community <coughs> and uh, the project has uh, er earned offset credits. But the evidence proved to be about as transparent as a slate chalkboard. Replacing a single toilet can produce a four-page record, but all the work at Cabrillo College claimed by Swenson produced one page stating how many toilets and urinals they replaced up there, and that page was signed by a Swenson foreman. Employees at the college did not corroborate Swenson's claims, casting doubt that all the work had been done, or if indeed any of it has claimed. I think it is incumbent on the district 
to provide concrete evidence of all of these claims by Swenson, and if there is no proof available, the credits granted to Swenson, the offset credits granted to Swenson, be withdrawn. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Randa Salak. I am also a customer of yours. Um, I want to just say positive things tonight. I really want to, <laughs> Carla's going, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I want to commend you for your increased attention to transfers. It's been noticeable. Um, I spoke to Jessica York a couple of days ago, and she's really um, helped with her couple of articles showing what is possible in this district, and I think it shows the public that the district is really looking broadly at what might happen. She doesn't get everything right, but she's pretty good, I think, and enough to say that, you know, she brought in some ideas about climate change, she brought in some ideas about the intertie, I think she's doing a good job, and now I think the public is much more aware of the transfer of possibilities. You know, they don't know, to, I mean, we all learn from you, the distinction between the North Coast water and the San Lorenzo waters, and, you know, we know that there's a lot of water available, but it depends on the city. The city thinks that you're the gatekeeper, you think that they're the gatekeeper. We know all that stuff is going on, but the city is willing to get water over here, and you seem willing to accept it. So I think that's a, a, a difference in the last maybe four or five months, that the public is much more aware of this. I didn't like to hear very much from the article that the saltwater intrusion is right at Potbelly Beach, which I live right on top of. So that was a little scary, and I think it's good. The scariness is good to keep people's you know, attention focused. Um, maybe in the next article that you give her information for, you could talk about groundwater modeling so people have an understanding of you know, all that rain. Does, just exactly what you're saying, Bruce. You know, it doesn't all go into the recharge. Um, I also have an idea for offset credits. Maybe since the offset credits look like you know all the toilets are bought and all the rest, maybe the bigger intertie could be, maybe offset money could go toward the bigger intertie between the two districts with a view toward what might happen when all the rights get settled out. And also about um, SoCal collectors, collector, anyway, I went to, I'm gonna come back and talk to you about 6.2, the stuff that's going at SoCal High, because I have a grandkid there and I have some ideas about that. The last thing is I just would urge you to speed up the chemistry tests. I see Taj isn't here right now, but anything that you can do um, simultaneously would really be great with a real clear aim of trying to get some water started this winter. So, thanks. I was positive, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Can I ask just one question about 6.2? Do I have to sit through all the rest of the stuff? I just want to make two sentence comment on SoCal High School. I'll be glad to do it after these are done. Yeah, we, we try and keep those things associated with the Separate. agenda item. So. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Hi, I'm Jerry Paul. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I want to second what people before me have said about let's get these water transfers going. There's a lot of water there. And also I want to uh, say thank you for your increased attention and understanding of water transfers. I, I know you'd go for it if, if the roadblocks weren't in the way, and you know, I, I believe your heart is you know, in, in the right place. And of course, you'd love to have water that's 10 or 15 times cheaper, and uh, that's what this is. Um, I also want to honor Director Daniels uh, and others for about the speech of earlier tonight about rainfall, evaporation, runoff, serious problems. And uh, uh, they're part of the study. No matter where the water comes from in the transfer, whether it's recycling wastewater or whether it comes from the river, same problem with the, with the, the, the part that comes from the rain uh, uh, originally. Um, in lieu stream water transfers from Santa Cruz offer more water than pure water SoCal does. So, uh, and at vastly less cost, and they start sooner, and they use a lot less energy. Start sooner? Yeah, they can start this December if the chemical tests 
and the and the pipe loop test, um, you know, yeah. are are done expeditiously, perhaps in parallel. And the, the it, it, it's better to do two tests in parallel, and one of which it wound up not being needed, and just so you can start sooner, because the water is here in December. Um, only about one sixth of the water, which is sitting in the Loch Lomond Reservoir right now as we speak, is is what Pure Water SoCal supplies in a year. One sixth. Uh, if we open the pipes, the, the inner tie and the Loch Lomond, uh, Felton Loch Lomond pipe, and the, the other, the, there's four things all together two pipes, a well, and water rights. If we did that, you get 2.4 times more water than that, which very quickly would go way ahead of the curve where you're, you're worrying about uh, rainfall and water supply. It'd be much better to get it from the river with big pipes. So I would like to encourage you to really advocate the big pipes. In fact, make a specific offer to Santa Cruz that if they get the big pipes in by date certain, you'll pay for them. Right now, you're faced with paying 65 or 70 million capital costs, plus finance costs, plus excess operating costs for Pure Water SoCal, total of maybe over 100 million, whereas water transfers are almost free the ones that start this December, and the ones with the big pipes cost maybe another 30 million to b fatten the pipes. That's much cheaper than the 100 million. You save 70 million. So please make them an offer, and it'll also get in the news, and you might get more action from them. That's what you expressed you wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Saying no one. Any director comments? Oh, I had a couple. I just had a couple of items. Um, uh, another thing in the paper today, uh, Sunday, was a report on the surprise uh, disaster in Santa Rosa as a result of the fire, uh, the disastrous Tubbs fire. It destroyed a neighborhood, the Fo Fountain Grove neighborhood, and it was leaving. I think 50, 350 homes were destroyed, but 13 survived. Uh, they started reporting toxic water in their water system, and so it led the fire department to investigate, and the entire, it just underscores how important, <laughs> I mean, how close, how serious the disaster is when a disaster really strikes. So it was 350 homes, five miles of piping in this one neighborhood, uh, destroyed, it's $43 million to replace just the piping in this neighborhood, in at least two years, so that stopped that rebuilding. But one of the things that I wanted to note about it is that the they had polyvinyl chloride uh, piping. It melted. The fire was so intense, and it leached carcinogens into the pipe. That's really what closed it down. But the disaster that was exacerbated by the a de decrease in water pressure that sucked the water out of the burning houses, those pipes and into the water system in general. So it's just, uh, uh, this is, this is a, clearly a disaster, but it does reflect how much of the work of the district is maintenance of these pipes, and it's expensive, and it, it's part of the, the actual service of providing safe water to the houses, our, our houses. So uh, it's, it was just very disheartening because they've had enough trouble. And then I also, I also wanted to report that I went to a meeting, you know, because part of the, you know, one part of our possible source of supply is uh, salt water, uh, desalinated water at, down at Moss Landing. And an oceanographer down in, uh, from Israel uh, gave a report on what is known, in, known about the environmental effects of saltwater plants. And it turns out that not that much has, has, been, uh, has been reported over, what, 50, over 50, 60 years since uh, desal plants began in this one area in the, sou the southeast or southeastern part of the Mediterranean Sea where 70% of all seawater is desalinized, desalinated. Uh, all the plants, that's the, the highest concentration, so they should have had a lot of experience with uh, environmental and biological effects of the water, and they did uh, 
there were some things that were a little disquieting in terms of the Marine Canyon, uh, Monterey Canyon, and that was that uh, the constitution of the brine that goes out is critical, and the known effects that they did report was a rise in salinity, temperature, uh, heavy metals, actually, very frequently because of, uh, and, uh, you know, depending on the scale, anti scaling devices that are used to keep the water flowing, that could cause uh, increased turbidity that could affect uh, biologic uh, populations. So, anyway, but there was very little thing, so it's very important to pay attention to the EIR when it comes out for that particular plant, too, because uh, there isn't really that much out there. So, that's it. Okay. There was one thing I wanted to mention, which was there was a meeting on Tuesday night, last Tuesday. Um, sounds like it happens every year. It happened last year. Uh, it's a joint meeting of their water commission and the council. Um, and uh, it started off looking at you know, the current situation. So they had graphs of the rainfall. They had graphs of the water flow in the, in the San Lorenzo and things like that. Temperature, they even had a temperature uh, measuring uh, uh, the illustration. And um, basically they have decided to, uh, you know, that this year was not a great year. Currently it's, what's the term? Extreme dry, dry hydro, it's, it's the driest they, ha they have. They think it's gonna eventually get up into merely the dry range, but they've pretty much decided it's not gonna get up into the normal range. Uh, so they did a stage one de declaration on Tuesday night. Um, and interestingly, they said that uh, the immediately preceding weekend is when the, uh, the reservoir finally spilled. It filled up so much that it went over the top of the reservoir. And for those who've looked at the contract, the arrangement between us and the city for this water transfer, this up to 300 acre feet, one, one of the requirements, or there's two requirements that are of interest. One is that either the reservoir is spilling or they feel very certain that it is about to spill. So the fact that it hadn't spilled until that weekend. And then another requirement is that they, they are not under any uh, stage restriction. So that means that this year, we might have gotten all of two days worth of rainfall uh, sent to us through the pipes. Uh, so that gives you some idea that, you know, this has not been an extreme drought like it was in 2014, but even this year was low enough that we basically would, would have gotten nothing through the uh, pipes uh, to speak of. Um, so um, then the next part of the meeting was talking about their long range plans about what they're doing. And as you may know, this is all gauged on the WASAC, the Water Supply Advisory Committee, which met for a couple of years and, and came up with this uh, plan. And they're following very strictly on that plan up till now, both the, both the commission and, and there are several members in the commission who were on the WASAC and the council itself. So they're staying to that strictly. And there are three parts to that. One is the transfer, second is recycled water, and third is desal. And they reported on all of those. Um, one interesting thing about this is that um, there are very specific requirements about what de data they need to get on all three of those in order to make a decision. And they will not make the decision until the, the end of year 2020. So that's two and a half years from now. So they're not going to do anything. They won't. They won't. They may solve the uh, the uh, water uh, thing with the fish uh, and uh, what's it called the habitat uh, conservation. AC HCP. Yeah, the habitat conservation. They may, if they can. They've been doing that for years now, trying to solve that. But they may do the HCP. But they won't do the uh, um, the uh, the plans and the and the new water rights things until they make that decision at the end of 2020. So that's going to happen at least past then. And knowing the w way the state board works on water rights, once they get that in motion of doing the EIR for it, and that's a p requirement, they first have to do an EIR, they th then have to submit an application, and then the state board has hearings and sits around and thinks about it and makes a decision. So that, won't, that process won't happen fast. So I'll say that the people who want us to increase the size of the pipe, uh, there'll be plenty of time to increase the size of the pipe. You know, we'll know a year or two ahead of time when that might actually happen. So it's not an emergency, it's not quick, and you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of uh, 
lot of lead time for that if it if and when it happens. Um, and for the things they're looking at, I'll start the back end, uh, desal. So that that would be a plan to put desal, kind of like we were doing with them, what four or five years ago now. It would be done in Santa Cruz. They have plans for the where they would run the pipes and where they would have the intake and where they'd have the outfall and so forth. So it's basically taking the EIR and they looked at it and they've made some changes to it, some things have been improved. The big problem is that since we were looking at it, the state board has come along and made new requirements. There's an ocean plan amendment they've done that has to be followed. And basically, pretty much to build one now, you have to do subsurface intakes. So the plan we had of doing uh, ocean, free ocean things is just, you, uh, for example, Orange County has been trying to get a, an exception to that for the last two years, and I, I think they haven't made much in the way of progress on that. So you basically have to prove that scientifically an open ocean intake uh, works and a subsurface does not work, and that's very hard. And so the city is very skeptical that the desal is even possible. Um, Second, they're looking at uh, recycled water. And mainly what they're looking at there is just using Title 22 uh, tertiary stage water to do irrigation. And the projects they've actually decided to do are there's a park right there by the sewage plant and they will use uh, tertiary water to water that park, the grass in the park. And then the second part of that is they'll take water and uh, send it up Bay Street uh, to the, the university and then they'll use that on their playing fields. And so they're not actually looking at using purified water, which is a problem because all of this is predicated on them getting 1.2 billion gallons of water a year during a drought. That's what they have estimated during a severe uh, drought they would need. So uh, spending a, a little bit of irrigation water doesn't even get that close and they admit it themselves. Uh, so the only thing they're left with then is the transfer idea. And uh, they're working with us. I, I mean, we can't fault them. I mean, they're, they're taking part of this with this pipe loot studies we're doing. They're paying half the cost of it. And, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars we're spending on all this stuff to get ready for this. And the city's right there with us. And because they see that, you know, if these other two things fail, the only thing that works for them really is to work with us on the transfer idea. And so... That's where they are right now. And with um, San Lorenzo Valley, too. Pardon? And with San Lorenzo Valley, too. Yeah, and Scott. so, yeah, right, at, with Scott, Scotts Valley or San Lorenzo yeah. Valley. And, but the problem with there is they don't even have a pipe going to them yet. And so that would require an EIR and funds and so forth. So um, and they weren't even talking much about that. Uh, I mean, clearly, if they do the transfer thing, we would be first because we already have the pipe, you know, the 1.x million gallon pipe uh, is already connected and so the, the current thing is that they would only then be able to give us water in the winter time if they have this this excess and uh, they would they would charge us for it uh, and uh, but it's cheaper than anything else we could get so that's why we're doing it. ask me afterwards or send me an email or something so I'd be I'd be glad to talk to you afterwards um, I think it's probably online, this, uh, this uh, presentation, and so you can get a copy and, and look at the, the things they sent out. But uh, it basically, uh, you know, they're st still continuing to pursue this, but it's going to be several years before they even make a decision. In fact, one of the things they discussed is that the, uh, the groundwater, the St Sustainable Groundwater Agency has to get a plan in by d January of 2020 by state requirements. But they won't even make a decision about which of these three things they're going to do till the end of 2020. So it's going to make it difficult for them to participate fully in some of those agency things. But so um, there was no resolution as to how they're going to manage that. But uh, they're certainly continuing with their with their studies. They have multiple consultants hired looking into all three of them, you know, coming up with the data about you know how much is it going to cost, when can they get it done. Um, all, all kinds of other different things, and that's how they'll make the choice of you know, which one of these three to follow. So, that's. Yeah. 
I don't know about this, I don't know about this year. They they were saying that uh, you know it, it only spilled that previous weekend, and then now they're under water restrictions. So I I don't know. That's what they said. I don't know either. But yeah, last year they would have been glad to give us water. But and by the way, we're doing all these loop studies and so forth, not because we want to, but because the state requires us to. After Flint, Michigan, and even was it Fresno, Fresno. had some problems like this too. The state is very leery of changing water sources. So anytime you change a water source, instead of using this water, you use that water. You have to go off and do all these studies and prove that it's not going to cause a problem. So. That's the way we stand. All right, let's move on. We got other things to do. Board calendar, should I? Planning calendar, yes, 5.1. Okay. Great. So yeah, just a couple things. So uh, Aqua, that meeting is uh, May uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th. Um, we haven't heard any response uh, for attendance uh, except from Bob Basso. Uh, he will be attending the legislative session. Thank you for that. Um, however, we do have a meeting on the 9th with the uh, Bureau up there, uh, and so staff is, uh, will definitely attend that meeting. We may not uh, attend Aqua either unless some board members were interested. Okay. Um, we got one. Uh, the hotels on site have filled up already, so we'll have to lodge off site, but let's converse on that. And then um, if there's anybody else uh, on the board who would like to uh, attend uh, with President Daniels and staff to the um, May 9th meeting with the Bureau of Reclamation, let us know too. Uh, something we do twice a year just to, uh, you know, develop the relationship. Let's see. Um, oh yeah, also on Wednesday, April 25th from five to eight is the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Group meeting at the Sheriff's Station. My understanding is uh, Director Jaffe won't be there. I'm giving a presentation. You're giving a presentation at a, another event. With my day job. With your day job. <laughs> <laughs> Can't make the, all these meetings. Um, I don't remember if we had an alternate or not for that. I don't think we do. Okay. Okay. Well, th I will definitely be there, and sometimes I know other board members show up because it's a public meeting for that, too. And then... Uh, Last but not least, the budget workshop coming up on May 1st, right before our next board meeting from 5 to 7. Um, uh, just a reminder that food will be provided. We'll provide you the same thing you got last time at our community water plan event, which was from Zamin's, unless you let Karen know differently, we'll get you the, the exact same thing food-wise. Uh, and if, if you do have an interest in Aqua or, again, or attending the, um, the May 9th meeting with the state and the, bureau and the feds, uh, please contact me, and I see uh, President Daniels is interested, so we'll converse. Thank you. Any questions about the calendar, staff, or I mean, directors or public? Okay, we go on to five two, special board assignments. Yeah, nothing to to report there. Just some minor uh, updates shown in red underline uh, on the rate evaluation. I think most people are apprised of that. It's on going. Um, had a nice public advisory committee on that one too, and that's that's it. Unless there's any questions. Any questions, directors? Nope. Public. Okay. We move on to five three. Organization wide comprehensive report. Were there any questions on the uh, conservation customer service field? Right up. Yes, Tom. Um, Yes, under C, the WDO program um, and the stormwater what seascape golf is course. This is page oh. 73. Okay. That's the first page. It just um, said you'll bring the analysis to the board when it is complete. And then um, also that seascape golf course indicated they plan to send a letter of interest. And my just question is just do you have an estimated time frame on those um, on the first item um, we did talk with uh, Georgina at hydrometrics and she anticipates completing um, the second task that we've asked them to do next week okay. and so we have that tentatively on the schedule for the second um, meeting board meeting in May bringing that back with an update okay. and then um, the golf course we need to circle back with them because we have not gotten the letter that 
they indicated they would be providing. So um, we'll follow up with them and okay, see where that is. But they did note that they were they were going to be sending that to us. And one, another question and a comment on the next page on page seventy four under new water service application process um, second bullet trying to coordinate with the county um, it's just once again I'm just do we have any kind of time frame they said county would get back to us yeah and we have not heard back from them um, today I did follow up with an email and ask them what the status was right. on um, they were gonna go back and take a look at some options which included either adding us to their electronic permit review cycle or providing um, the applicant the development project applicant and the district with some sort of notification and then we would be able to follow up with that customer so those were the two options that we talked about and where they landed I'm not sure so we're working on that okay my last comment was just on on page 77 just the uh, information about the leak alerts from master meter um, yes mm -hmm. I was just gonna say that's great I mean the fact that they can get instantaneous information yeah. is huge uh, yeah. for a leak alert so thanks for following up on those mm -hmm. and that if you have a mobile application yeah yes yeah. you can get it right away you can get it as well so unfortunately that's, that's a lot of the features that the yes. GUI system has it's unfortunate for them but good for all of our customers perhaps I have one thing I wanted to bring up which is um, on 74 that you mentioned we have the WDO at, at the bottom and then you flip the page to 75 and we have the basically the conservation activities and there's one thing there the toilet rebate in the past toilet rebate was conservation now it's actually part of the WDO and so to lump it in to me seems wrong because it looks like you know, this is stuff we're actually conserving, but this mm -hmm. is actually offset to new development. So sure. I think it should be on the previous page with the Okay, rest we can of the separate WDOs. that out and yeah. put it with the WDO. Right, thanks. Anything else? Okay. Tosh? Hi, good evening. Um, on our status report, we have several items, but I'll try to highlight just a few that I want to draw your attention to. Um, we are finishing up the Cornwell tank project. This. Uh, the exterior was finished on Monday, so that's an update there. Um, we should be filling that tank on Monday, uh, a week from yesterday, mm -hmm. and getting it back in service. Um, it does; it will play a big part if we do isolate a small zone in our district, sub area one, for the surface water test uh, pilot program. Um, we're continuing to push forward with designing the cast iron main replacement along Soquel Drive. That's a stretch between Cabrillo College and State Park. That'll be included in the uh, next fiscal year's budget. And that's a $4.1 million project, but a very leak-prone stretch um, that we've documented very well. And when it does break, it's high pressure and it's a larger main, so it's a pretty significant leak. Um, I, I guess earlier in the meeting there was some comments made um, by um, a member of the public uh, indicating commenting on the county's work in the right of way and how that may not shouldn't have been paid for by the district but there are two projects here that we um, we are a guest in the county's right of way and so we there's a new one here Main Street uh, they're planning some new sidewalk curb and gutter and we have to move our infrastructure. The um, situation in Aptos Village was they're putting in a, a, bi a bus turnout and our water main needed to be relocated. So that is typical. We've done that in the past and I just wanted to point that out again. Uh, for the surface water update last month, I did provide a briefing for the board a presentation. Um, we're having our, our coordination meeting tomorrow so I don't really have much more but as you know, the, the testing continues and it'll continue through next month. And we'll report out, out on that in May or June. Mm -hmm. Probably next month we'll give you another update. The last thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, the economy is doing much better and um, our staff is in charge of overseeing all the uh, remodels as well as will serves that come to you. What you don't see are all the remodels. The 
those services already have those addresses already have domestic service, so they don't they're not required to go through the water demand offset program or get a will serve letter, but they are required to put in fire s services, and so just this in in this current s state we have 14 active um, developments that are getting fire services. And in this last quarter, we had four of them that we had to oversee during construction and completed. So each one of those is handled um, through contracting and inspecting and coordinating with that. So we see an uptick in the, in the economy. Any questions? Questions? Um, o and M. Um, I don't have anything to add at this time if you have any questions. Looks like not. Thank you. Special projects? <laughs> I'm still on vacation. I guess that's the first thing. I was out on vacation for two weeks, just got back on Monday. So, um, investigating the walls. <laughs> <laughs> the outreach team did uh, fill in this um, part of the report. I'll just um, add two things, actually, three things. Um, as you know, we have a monthly article in the Times Publishing Group this month. Dr. Daniels wrote an article on climate change. I would like to extend that offer to other board members. If you're interested in ever writing a piece, um, it is a once a month article that you can contact me or Ron and we can work on getting you guys folded into it. Otherwise, staff typically does write the article. Um, in terms of the community water plan and the Pure Water Soquel project, um, in the last week and a half, our Title 16 federal feasibility study was approved. So that is a big milestone for us. In December, January, we had the state one approved. This is the federal one, which now opens the door for us to apply for Title 16 money under the new WIN Act um, process. So the next step in terms of that process is that um, our project and Soquel Creek Water District will be included in a, a letter of findings to Congress. And then once that's approved, then we will be um, eligible to apply for the next funding cycle. Um, and in terms of the draft EIR, ESA has been diligently uh, working on the second admin draft that was received by staff this week. So we still are at this point on schedule to have the draft EIR released to the public this summer. And the last thing to report on, um, um, as part of the Title 16 Federal Feasibility Study, we did do some additional uh, pilot work that was recommended from the NWRI, the National Water Research Institute, to um, do some further analysis on that secondary effluent for tertiary treatment. So the SCID was delivered um, a couple weeks ago. It's been installed. We're just waiting for a pump. And then we'll start um, conducting a three-month pilot study there at the wastewater treatment plant. And we've been coordinating with the Public Works Department uh, very well. They've been doing the heavy lift of setting, that, setting the treatment pilot plant up. We had a coordination call today, and uh, they're ready to go. So it's exciting. That's a good question. Sure. Yes. Yeah, um, could I just ask, so what, can you clarify again what that's going to test for? Yeah, that just helps us for additional pre-design work. Uh, the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility does treat to a secondary plus, but that's with a trickling filter system. So we do have some data that we could cull from Marina. Um, that's another facility that does that. But it just helps us better understand. That's a key component when we do design work on getting that water prepared from going from secondary to tertiary. The ROUV step is is better to find once you know what the water is but coming out is of the This is treating to tertiary, you said? Treating to tertiary. Okay. And, and my Melanie, um, I are you testing different filters to see what provides the best value and that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. So it's an open platform pilot test unit, so we'll be able to test three different skids. Okay, good. Finance, please. So I just wanted to touch base real quick and assure the board that I am continuing to monitor the um, state efforts towards water affordability. Um, I did participate um, in the web streaming that they had on April 5th on their water affordability symposium. And I just gave you kind of a brief update on kind of the direction they're, he they're heading with that. And I'll continue to monitor any, any progress they're making on that, uh, on that front. 
I also wanted to let you know that we are participating in a pilot program on uh, financial sustainability through the Government Finance Officers Association. We're, uh, there are only 27 agencies uh, nationwide that are participating, all of them municipalities and counties. We're the only um, water district, we're the only special district, we're the only non-municipality or, or county that's participating. And it's um, really using that common pool theory to look at long-term financial planning as opposed to short-term budget planning and really getting ourselves on a financially sustainable track. So we'll be continuing to roll that out and work on that over the next couple of years. And then I just gave you some brief updates on, on some of the projects that we're working on. Thank you. That sounds great. That was mm -hmm. interesting. Human resources. Um, I just want to make special note uh, in my um, presentation or in my report that there will be a week of celebration on May 7th through the 11th and we will be celebrating public employee, public service employees um, and we have a series of events that we plan on having that week to really celebrate our staff and make sure that they know that we appreciate the good work that we do. We'll also be pushing some information out to our public so that they understand the detail of the work that you guys have been talking about tonight um, that, our, that our employees do and, and what we should um, be celebrating during that week. So stay tuned, you'll be getting some information from Human Resources. Thanks. Thank you. General Manager, please. Yes, great. Just one thing to report on. I, I see um, Larry Friedman uh, out there who is a member one, uh, on our public advisory committee. He's one of our members of the public. And he was the one that alerted us to uh, the opening with the state grant guidelines that uh, suggested modifications that we met with the state and they did and they modified and not only increased the grant from one to two million dollars but opened the door for many more well thank you for that and we've taken that philosophy to heart now to the federal level they've uh, opened the door also for suggestions so last week um, in conjunction with some other agencies but on behalf of the district we submitted a, a comment letter regarding their guidelines and um, showing how they may be modified in a way which meets their uh, main objective and also would benefit uh, our agency and other agencies like ours. And we think overall just make the uh, grading point process for grant applications much fairer across the board to everybody. So we hope to have some success with that to keep you updated. Okay, good. Anyone in the public wish to address this item, this report? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I am really happy <laughs> that your staff is meeting with the Santa Cruz County Planning Department because there's been a huge disconnect between the planning and land use issues and, and water issues. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that you've met with Mr. Guinea and Mr. Martin Heaney and that you're, you're trying to work this out because it's a problem. <laughs> Thank you, good work. Um, I also want to uh, point out in the um, discussion about the AMI meters for the Aptos Village project that, um, and I, I submitted some late correspondence about this, but the state of New Mexico has banned them, uh, AMI, from um, utility use in the state. And I think um, it would be wise of your board to look at that. I did forward you information and that was uh, sent to me by Arthur Furstenberg. Um, I discourage this use in the public. I think there are people who are very sensitive to it and I think it's getting to be a cumulative damage to not only people, but to the environment, notably the the honeybees and our pollinators and, and we don't know what else. So I think um, I would appreciate uh, putting the brakes on AMI meters in your district. And I also want to point out regarding meters in the Aptos Village project that in reading the um, minutes for the March 20th meeting that when you had the public hearing for the variance for the Rancho Del Mar Shopping Center uh, submeters, it was pointed out in the minutes for that action that the Aptos Village 
also got this variance, but will not have to pay the uh, monthly service charge for the master meters. Rancho Del Mar does, but Aptos Village does not. And it was stated in the minutes that the reason um, Rancho Del Mar has to pay that is to accommodate staff time to uh, calculate any discrepancies with the submeters and the master meters. I don't think this is fair. And I think that um, I, I would really like an explanation about why Aptos Village is getting that concession. Um, I also want to point out to you in the um, discussion about water service applications, um, Aptos Village plan currently under construction and there's work that you would put pipes under the, um, the railroad tracks to Parade Street, as I'm reading it. Um, there is legal action on the horizon for that. And that crossing may not happen because of legal action. So I just want to give you that alert. It's not my legal action, I want to make that clear. But there is legal action by the, the property owners in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, let's move on to 5.4, the uh, Finance Administrative Services Committee meeting summary. And I'm just here to answer any questions you might have about our meeting on April 9th. I'm good. There's not? a miter, a miter correction that said uh, there under the minutes it said public members and it's really public attendance, I guess. Okay, I'll make sure you note that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Anyone in the public on this one? Okay, we go to five five, which is public outreach committee. Yeah, we discussed a few things at the meeting. If any of the board members like to comment that'd be great but I'll just point out that uh, one of the things that we have seen other agencies do and thought we may investigate is the idea of a citizens water academy program actually Capitola does something similar here for the city and we participate in that and tell uh, citizens about you know the, our services and, and they learn all about the other city services but for us it'd be a way to uh, engage the public there are members out there who want to know more and uh, just go over maybe a year and meet once a month and that sort of thing and then they can also become ambassadors if they wish or just share what they what they learn about the agency so uh, public outreach has taken that uh, task on to evaluate it further I know the city of Santa Cruz had a water school or university or something they called it so anyone who had a uh, a fine could get uh, get out of the fine by going to water school. Right, uh, it was a great idea. An interesting <coughs> idea to get people to learn yeah. more that maybe they don't want to, but they <laughs> don't want to pay money. So, okay, <laughs> worth considering. Public? No. Okay, public outreach. Uh, that was that one. Five six. The water resources committee. So nothing to report out there unless um, you have any questions. Directors, public, no. no. Okay, district council. There's nothing new in the cases. None of them have come down or changed, but um, two things. One is that we still are part of this JM pipe lit mm -hmm. litigation, mm -hmm. and there was quite a move by one of the firms that was the litigation firm to withdraw and then there was a possibility that the other firm withdraw and the case would go away and we received notice today that the one that was purporting or proposing to withdraw has changed their mind and so they're going to go ahead and participate and there's a damage hearing in October um, so that may well at least give an indication of where things are going in in that regard okay and questions Okay, thank you. Oh, the, the other thing was that the, the John Cole case, the rate case, mm -hmm. the hearing on that has now been set for the 24th, which is next week. Okay. We'll serve letters, please. We have two will serves letters tonight for you to look at. There, uh, one thing I want to point out is item 6.1.2 has already been seen by the board last September. Um, the reason we brought it back is the developer uh, wanted to make a change to the to the proposed project and the change resulted in an increase in water use and water demand offsets so 
um, we felt even though this is a, um, a redevelopment of an existing site that, that has a significant water use currently, so even though the, the revised proposal is less than the current use, we felt we should bring it back to you. That's if, if you can give us a nod, we would not likely do that if the development changed and reduced um, water demand offset. Okay. okay. Um, so these two projects, I'm willing to answer any questions if you wish, if you have any. Questions? No. Public? Becky Steinbrenner, again, I just want to encourage you to say no. <laughs> and thank you, President Daniels, for your consistent vote of no for increased demand on an overdrafted aquifer. Thank you. Okay, so we have two items. Motions? I'll just point out before I make my motion that with the water demand offset program, we're not having an increased demand on the system or I wouldn't be approving them either. Mm -hmm. But I will make the motions. Okay. I'll second it. A motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I oppose. So that's, that passes. Three one. Okay. 6.2 approval of Waterwise Garden Grant. Yes, we have an application tonight um, for a Waterwise Garden uh, landscape makeover from SoCal High School. And in particular, it's from the Natural Resources and Agriculture. Um, class and the teacher Tom Bentley um, they're proposing to um, replace about 550 square feet of existing turf in the upper campus um, around this uh, parking island that's shown here um, in the memo and uh, to replace that with waterwise landscape and to um, use uh, students to use it as an educational experience for the students that will be performing the site preparation. And also um, the other benefits of the project include um, that there's a lot of high visibility um, in addition to saving the water and the student um, interaction. And they, it, they're also planning to certify the landscape as a Monterey Bay friendly landscape and to have signage to that effect. And so um, they're asking for a $2,000 grant. Um, we budget for up to five of those this year, so we had a total of $10,000 for this grant, and none have been granted yet to date. So there's plenty of funding left, and uh, we're also combining the um, replacement with a community workshop that is gonna be happening on Saturday, May 12th, from 10 to 1. So the public can come and, and get involved in that and learn all about how to do it and, and assist with that effort. So with that in mind. Any questions? I have just one. It sounds like a wonderful project and uh, 150 students involved, highly visible. But my, my only question is on the, the sign. It says Monterey, this is page 108 of 144. It says the Monterey Bay Friendly Landscape. Um, it'll be certified as that and assigned a noting that will be put in place. Will there be any sign noting that it, this is a water-wise project uh, from Soquel Creek? Yeah, I believe there's some additional signage in, in, in addition to the Monterey Bay Friendly. Um, but in order to become Monterey Bay fin Friendly certified, uh, you have to do things that save water as part of your project, yeah. so no, I'm, I'm, I'm very supportive of it. I just, I, I would like to vote for this, but I'd like to, to put a, um, a, a condition that there be a sign, saying that this is, you know, something with Soquel Creek on it, that's that's there as well. Okay. I was going to ask if we're going to have signage there about the various plants that are there, so that people can learn from it directly. Uh, yeah, I'm not certain about that. I do know that signage is very expensive because it has to be anchored and um, be able to withstand weather and and other things. Um, I'm not exactly certain of the signage. Ask them what they okay. intend. 
I just had one question. Originally, they were going to do the whole island, and they, and they changed it. Do you happen to know why? I think a lot of it had to do with cost, um, utilities that are co-located in that area. Uh, there is a large tree there. So I think they just decided to scale it back to start with and that it might they might be able to expand it in the future. So kind of bite off a small chunk to okay. start with. Any public comment? kid going to school there, the second grandkid, and he's in the gardening class. Mateo is loving it. And so many, when I did gardening as part of my teaching, so many of the kids were so drawn in who were not otherwise academic. This is a perfect chance to teach them about water conservation. And it doesn't cost much at all to make little plant signs, the way they do at the Arboretum, you mm -hmm. know, to stick around, for the, which I think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that you support Mr. Bentley's project. and. If you have more money for that, I have an idea for more money for that. I would like to see it tied into teaching the students about cistern possibilities, about rainwater conservation from that, from that building. The whole Soquel, okay, so I heard Bobby Markowitz talk a few years ago specifically about Soquel High to a group of parents who were angry about turf. And what he said was that there's enough rain runoff in normal years from Soquel High to do all their irrigation. This would be a great tie-in for those students to learn that. Not only that central area, everybody passes that area, so it's a, it's a really visible place. But that would be a good tie-in with the um, workshop that they're going to have in conjunction with it to let both parents and the students understand that they could be doing water collecting right then. And if there is some extra money from your you know, uh, fund, Maybe Mr. Bentley would like to do a second stage of this and go on to teaching the students about that and possibly actually collecting water from Soquel Roof. So I think it's a great idea. Um, I think that the identifying that is a good idea too because parents are always looking to see what they can plant, right? And students, in this case, are so enthusiastic about not only this class but the idea that they're at the cutting edge of things that they take it home to their parents mm -hmm. and say, look, this is how you do water-wise growing. So. Thank you very much. I hope you found okay. it. Thank you. Does our rebate for rain collection apply to only residences? No. It okay. applies to everybody. So there's a rebate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got it to my house. I'd like to see so tell you guys, sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Becky Steinbrenner, thank you for working with the schools. It's always a good project, and as Randa said, it it keeps on giving to the future and really engages a lot of kids. I've worked on a number of school gardens in the times that my kids have been at different schools. And um, the signage is critical, but it doesn't have to be expensive. We, I did a butterfly garden and it was expensive, but what can be done is just laminated signs because initially that's when the real interest is there. and. It, you can always put signs in later, but once you get people's attention with a new planting, a new change, just laminated signs are great. Um, and I think it would also uh, be great, as Randa said, to tie in some uh, recharge opportunities with that. Um, I don't know what the soils are like there, probably in a parking lot, it's not the best of recharge, but um, just focusing on that possibility as uh, a learning moment can be great. And I really want to thank you for supporting the school. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to make the motion that we uh, grant the funding for $2,000 and that uh, that be contingent on there being a sign indicating our involvement with the project. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. Great. And uh, could you communicate, please communicate to them the ideas that were presented here? And Certainly. I, for one, would be receptive to additional money. You know, it seems like you're granting additional money if it, for a different stage to this, because it seems like this is really a lot of, you know, bang for the buck with mm -hmm. 150 students and such high visibility. Okay, we go on to 6-3, Professional Consultant Services. 
Sure, thank you. Anoop, if you want to come to the podium, I'll go ahead and just say a couple things to kind of set this up and, and then introduce Anoop Shah from Brown and Caldwell who will be giving a short presentation. The item 6.3 is an addendum to the scope of work to the professional services contract we have with Brown and Caldwell. Brown and Caldwell was hired in 2015 to help support Soquel Creek Water District's evaluation efforts of the Pure Water Soquel project. And um, with their support over the years, they have provided um, an extension of staff specifically to the technical um, services and technical evaluation to support the studies and the environmental analysis that we're doing with the Pure Water Soquel project. Back in January, I think that was January 23rd, the board had a workshop and it was really focused on the community water plan and everything encompassing um, under the umbrella of the supplemental water supply options. And so the way that Ron has um, kind of established oversight of the multifaceted program components in that is by department managers. So Pure Water Soquel efforts are, are under me, Stormwater Capture is under Shelley, Christine and Taj have been doing the heavy lift on the river water uh, transfer project in. At that January 23rd meeting, we, we, we came and we gave an update. We prepared this big schedule. We recognized that there were a lot of, um, a lot of things happening all at once, and some things are at high levels, and some levels are at, at more refined details. And so as we came out of that workshop, we really did start to identify what are our gaps going forward for budget planning as well as just for implementation of our community water plan. And with that, we started talking with Brown and Caldwell more and Sunny Wang, who has been the technical advisor under the BC team, was like, you know, I really feel it's, it's time that you guys look at um, looking at the community water plan as a program that needs to be managed, very similar to what the city of Santa Cruz recently did when they hired HDR for a lot of their CIP projects. And so um, for about the last month, we've been in some coordination and discussions with Anoop Shaw um, from BC. He's out of their San Jose office and he is, um, this is what he has done. I do have a little bio I do want to say because I want you guys to understand and know a little bit about Anoop. Um, he is the managing business consultant based out of Brown and Caldwell San Jose office and he brings 15 years of experience to the water industry. He is focused um, on project management and the pro and is a project manager who has led various large multidisciplinary design teams and can deliver complex engineering programs. Currently, he is the client advisor on a conjunctive water use program in the Santa Margarita River Basin. What I liked about Anoop's qualifications when Sonny first uh, introduced him to us was that I think he can look at things both in a big picture as well as small, and I think that's what the community water plan needs. So uh, we've been working, especially Taj and Ron, while I was on vacation, in developing this scope that we're proposing today. Um, it is to develop a, a, a framework for us to manage um, the programs and recognizing that we have a small staff. One thing I did want to note, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Anoop, is that you know we are in this uh, nice space with um, some additional funding through the Prop 1 planning grant. And as an item in that grant, there is a task specific to project management. So we have put in this item as a potential item to be funded if the board approves it. So I'm going to turn it over to Anoop, and then we'll, we're both here for question and answer. Thank you, Melanie. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as Melanie mentioned, um, this particular uh, uh, item, agenda item, talks about the project management information system, but it really is to set up the framework to support the community water plan and develop that further. And what you'll uh, notice in your um, agenda there, uh, there are three specific uh, tasks we have uh, identified. But all these tasks are really doing is to support the staff in continuing to look at uh, the community water plan as it develops and really uh, augment them with either the technical reviews on as needed program support. And while all of those uh, activities are ongoing, also to develop a, pro uh, a project management information system uh, framework and, and it also in conjunction work with developing a robust schedule that looks at every single critical uh, decision items and get ahead of uh, critical milestones. So let me um, 
walk through that real quick. Um, as Melody mentioned, uh, community water plan is a multifaceted uh, plan. It includes uh, water conservation, groundwater uh, recharge, but even within the supplemental water supply options, it, we have four potential options from pure water SoCal to river transfers, whether it's a, a, a short-term uh, river transfer or the long-term San Lorenzo River aspect, uh, even desal is still under consideration as we heard in the discussion today, and uh, potential stormwater uh, capture. Now, all of these uh, facets, especially uh, under supplemental water supply option, can have its own project uh, life cycle. So as, as the community water plan develops further, each one of these facets, uh, take for example the river water transfer, once that project starts going further, we are already talking about the potential permitting issue, potential environmental issues, uh, public involvement, program management, if uh, when it gets into the execution aspect, uh, there is a critical component about the schedule management that we are talking about. Um, and a, a more important aspect, more tangible aspect is about the funding, getting ahead of the funding uh, regulation. So all these programs or the project options, what it tends to do is it becomes an information overload. Uh, as Melanie mentioned, uh, staff <coughs> here is limited. Uh, they already have a, a fairly full portfolio on their own. And when you start talking about these options and their project life cycles, uh, it can be overwhelming. So what we are talking about through project management information system is just to <coughs> build a, a framework that allows for managing the information better. Uh, it gives us an idea to uh, better manage uh, the information flow that's coming through, get better manage the schedule, better manage even the reporting to the board and the public at large. And, uh, and what it boils down to is distilling some of this information through various dashboards or uh, outreach. Um, what we have, uh, you know, all it is project management information system is not um, anything fancy. It really needs to be the right size uh, for the SoCal. Um, People talk about project management system as an out-of-the-box uh, system, something more like you may have heard eBuilder or Primavera P6. Those are on subscription basis, could be fairly expensive on uh, per license basis. Um, the benefits of uh, out-of-the-box system could be, uh, it can be deployed quickly and uh, uh, once the program is done, you remove the subscription, the costs go away. But the, the challenge with those kind of systems is there's no residual value. You invest a lot of this money as if you're paying rent for uh, building up that framework to manage the information and, and report out. But as soon as you remove the subscription, there's nothing left of it. Versus a custom developed solution is, uh, has a lot of residual value uh, in terms of uh, you can retain a lot of that institutional knowledge and investment into it. It can be leveraged for a lot of the other activities that's already happening within the engineering department. For example, if you develop a project management uh, PMIS uh, that can support l CIP program, uh, even the execution of projects here, uh, that can be done. So what we are planning to do is um, we want to work through, uh, we will work through different uh, scenarios with the staff and figure out what is the right solution. We looked at um, similar setup, similar situation at different programs, different cities. One in, uh, example is from Lake Oswego Tigard program in Oregon, a similar size program, and there it was a, a custom developed uh, PMIS um, versus some of the larger programs tend to be more out of the box. So what we are suggesting is we'll conduct a needs assessment workshop um, with the staff and the um, and understand what are the current processes. Um, based on the needs assessment, we want to understand, really just get a better view of overall landscape, understand uh, where the needs are, acknowledge the, the gaps, um, and then talk about how to build the PMIS based on the needs. There's an intermediate step in between about the, the processes 
um, and the workflows, that's the challenging piece, and we'll talk about that um, in just a moment. Once the needs are established, once those prioritized uh, plans are done, then we'll uh, go into the implementation phase. And all it is is setting up the business processes and functionalities that support the development of community water plan. It's a really an options agnostic. It's just a framework to get a better discipline in decision making. And that can lead to or uh, support along with is just a detailed schedule. I wanted to talk about uh, the specific things uh, on the schedule piece. Uh, you may have seen this, uh, the schedule snapshot on the left of the screen. That's a very macro level sc uh, schedule. Um, what ends up happening is as, as we move forward, um, we need to get ahead of some of the critical uh, deadlines. And I'll give you a quick example on funding opportunities and how that cascades in. From the board standpoint, um, we'd like to entertain different funding opportunities. Well, uh, the deadline for the funding window when it opens is, is fixed, and we need to work backwards from it. What information, what are the gaps? And in order to address those gaps, what decisions needed to be made from the board? And in order to, for board to make that decision, what information you need that staff needs to pre get ready, uh, prepared for. So we will be helping and supporting uh, staff in getting a better handle on the schedule and put that out there on the PMIS. Um, so really, uh, this, this uh, task we are talking about is, um, is agnostic of what options you move forward with. It just supports overall community water program. It supports pure water SoCal. It, supports, it will support um, water conservation efforts. It will support uh, stormwater capture and river transfer. Um, with that, I'll leave it up to um, open it up for questions and uh, any other information I can provide. Um, so my first question is just so how does this compare to the other options of continuing as we are, you know, so cause since this is expensive or having another staff member to do this because this is only going to be a part time person and a computer program. So just looking at those two different options. Do you want to answer first? Or you want to yeah, sure. Um, so part of the, the program uh, expertise where we think about, and this was a similar issue at Santa Cruz as well, um, it, the, the level of experience and expertise we bring based on a lot of other programs mm -hmm. uh, to bring that kind of a program manager to finding, recruiting, and retaining that kind of uh, employee or staff that's generally a challenge and uh, ends up being significantly more cost than to establish a system and just bringing as needed support from the program team. So that happens to be one aspect. And the second aspect is uh, this platform that we are talking about that has a residual value. It extends far beyond the program's life cycle. It can support and bring efficiencies, even day-to-day -day operations um, at the district in implementing project uh, and infrastructure projects. Thank you. Tracy also wants to add something. Sorry, sure. if you don't mind me stepping in. Hi. Um, from I was a human, wondering. From a human resources perspective, you know, we do take a look at, at staffing needs. And sometimes um, certain projects, certain implementations of, of things that we're doing within the district, we do look at the differences between bringing staff on versus um, a consultant work. This definitely does fall in line with consultant type work um, because it would be establishing something that we don't currently have. Um, we probably would be dealing with the maintenance of that from an ongoing perspective. Bringing somebody on board, as we all know, have some long-term costs and uh, liabilities for the district, and so those are things that we weigh when we're considering these types of options. So, thank you, thank you both. Any other questions? Well, I was, uh, you know, it seemed like the, um, the at least from how the district functions, the budget process and the is integral to the whole community water plan too. And I was wondering wh where that fit into how that was organized. Because I didn't oh. hear it mentioned. No, that's, that's great. So um, I have a, a couple of slides if uh, I can talk about that uh, example project from Lake Oswego. But the idea is uh, we begin with aspect of what is the end game or what is the desired outcome on the long run. 
And then uh, a lot of these PMIS systems can support uh, project uh, funding requests, the forms that the staff would start with through a, a approval process. And that framework, that workflow supports not only just the program, but even uh, annual uh, process of budgeting at the, at the district. So that's an efficiency that uh, can be leveraged even after the program. I don't know if I answered your <coughs> question in that. Yeah. So l let me qu quickly uh, see if, if uh, this uh, answers. So th these are a few extra slides from this reference project at the Lake Oswego. Um, there the two agencies were working together in uh, delivering about 175 <coughs> million uh, dollar program and there the reporting requirements were pretty stringent given that the funding requirements from different uh, funding sources that had a significantly higher reporting requirements not only that they had a very active uh, uh, public engagement and public demanded uh, the level of reporting so they put together this PMIS um, from the reporting and dashboard standpoint. So this is what the interface looks like. But I in the background of this is um, a framework that supports uh, project information as uh, funding requests come for different projects, in what phase of execution they are. And um, after the program was completed, right now this program is done, they're using the same framework for <coughs> annual budget planning. Um, so if Taj was working on a particular project to bring it forward in, uh, for the board on funding requests, that system would be, uh, that information would be submitted in the system and would put together the CIP on an annual basis. Uh, these are different uh, viewpoints about uh, how different projects are moving forward, what the invoices look like, what is the um, uh, status of the project. So. This is sort of the what goes behind on the on the PMIS framework. So, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I please. Actually, I don't understand how how it's different than what we're already doing with the processes that we go through. Uh, I remember going over this with you in the past. Uh, the different project timelines and budgetary questions were factored into that too. Is that just a graphic, purely graphic thing or was it right. just more so of a programmatic? So I think it's a combination of things. I think from the Pure Water SoCal project, mm -hmm. we've been able to do it at that kind of higher level, that, that mm -hmm. graphic on the left that was done in PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, and it has very high level things. We're getting to a point with some of our projects, specifically with the projects within the projects. It's just like, oh my God, options within options, projects within projects, and we're all doing it kind of within our own silos. And then when there's an update, we either have a, a committee meeting or we have a workshop or we have these meetings, we're on tasks. So everybody give us summary report and we all put it together and then we kind of put it away and then the next two months we update it. This is gonna be a living, document for a program that is living. The community water plan has a lot of components and we're all kind of managing it into our little own silos based on the time that we have when we're doing our day-to-day -day stuff plus being managers of staff and we're, we're deficient on it. It's, you know, we've recognized that it's something that um, is hard for us to manage and that's why we've, we've reached out to this to I think become more successful in, this, in keeping track of things, and things are all moving, and they're moving at different paces. And for the example, you know, in January for the surface water transfer project, that's a separate schedule that has a schedule that was created by WASAC that isn't maintained. That we kind of, kind of, on chicken scratch, have kind of moved it, moved things around based on where they are with their stuff. But still, a lot of it's moving and un unknown, and we just really need to kind of pull the schedule together, which would be in Microsoft projects, which we have, and utilize a computer system with Microsoft SharePoint that the district has just kind of, um, I guess, but brought on with our new Microsoft 365 conversion. But these are tools that, you know, they have there, you can do everything with it and, and without some training and knowledge, or maybe uh, especially of a, of a team who we already have on board has something that they can say, you know, we developed all of this. We did 90% of the legwork with these other agencies 
and we can help you kind of get everything together, that, that's where we are with, with our community water plan. And, and if I may add a few extra things, that's a great uh, summary, even from the planning standpoint, but you know, what's coming down the pike is, uh, if you think about VIFIA, for example, so if district were to get VIFIA uh, funding, VIFIA has a significantly higher level of reporting requirements. And we are not, uh, you know, staff is not subjected to that level of reporting just now, but that's coming. So th what this does is it establish the framework to allow for a much simpler and easier time in terms of the reporting aspect. Um, the same thing happens in terms of um, uh, if there are projects that are co done in conjunction with City of Santa Cruz, how is that funding allocation is done? Uh, as different projects get executed, uh, that reporting aspect would just become uh, significantly dif um, difficult and more demanding on staff's time. And that's where this, the efficiency of this system would come in. And not to put the cart before, before the horse, but um, a significant chunk of this uh, PMIS is also from the project execution standpoint, having a, sig um, uh, a common set of standard that applies to all projects. So you have the assets when you acquire them, they are consistent from the standard standpoint that you can then later on manage. So uh, a system like this would make it easier to apply the common standard. Right now, the staff or the district is not uh, attuned to delivering a program of this size. It's coming, so this is setting up the foundation to get ready for all those requirements. And, and I'll chime in. I, I use one of the out-of-the-box ones when I was a consultant, and we, we've gotten to that stage now with the multiple projects that we, go, that we have going on. Primavera is the one we used. And we see that it's too complex. I mean, you can miss one little thing and it can trip you up down the road significantly. Um, so uh, uh, an investment like this, what we're talking about, can easily save you just on one item from tripping or, or missing something, timing, maybe missing another river transfer because we forgot to do X or Y or, or something like that. So, you know, in my previous life as a consultant, um, this was, status quo at, at, at where we're in the point where we're at with the complexity and the level of what we're dealing with. Well, I've got a few things that come to my mind. Um, I mean, a project management system is such a generic piece of software. Yeah. I mean, everything from, you know, launching a, a rocket to Mars and, you know, putting in a new highway or, you know, anything does this. Absolutely. So I can't see why spending $120,000 to investigate these, I mean, for example, what does Brown and Caldwell use for their software for this? I'm sure you do project management, right? Right. So we have a custom developed system, our, our own internal. Um, our projects are more uh, service delivery, mm -hmm. but uh, we... Ours are too, aren't they? Uh, you're building infrastructure. We don't build infrastructure, but okay. yeah. All yeah. right. But, you know, point well taken. I think what we have done is more of our internal custom developed uh, mm -hmm. system. Uh, some of the larger firms, they tend to have a bigger box system, out of the box, uh, similar to Oracle, JD Edwards, things like that. Um, the question be uh, really and boils down to is, what is the right system? There's solution for everything, but what is needed really for district? We don't need to overcomplicate things uh, that don't need to be. Uh, that's the crux of Well, that's, that was another issue I have, is that you know, doing the needs analysis is nice. That tells you what you need exactly. now. Yep. But we probably not going to want to do this and then throw it away in a couple of years and then go, we would like a system that works not for just the projects we're working on now, but the projects we're going to work on for the next couple of decades, maybe, exactly. that we don't even know what those are. So you know, concentrating on a needs analysis of just what we're doing now is not sufficient. And in which case, you know, the fact that this is fairly generic. If we were to get a system that fairly powerful and generic, then it should be able to do not just what we're doing today, but what we're going to be doing in 20 years, which we don't know what they are, but this is powerful enough to be modified to, to deal with those. That, that's exactly right. I think the, the systems, that the acquisition aspect of how mm -hmm. the project gets uh, thought about, how its uh, funding is required, and how it gets executed. I think those fundamentals remain the same. So this is a lot of, uh, we can set up the system which is very scalable uh, and, and keeping it simple in a way that uh, matches 
district space um, and, and needs. And a lot seems to be made out of this distinction between out of the box and custom. And for out of the box, there's, there seem to be a lot made of the fact that a subscription, and I think pretty much every software package we buy, we also buy a subscription because, you know, that's the updates and the maintenance and, and you know, bug fixes and all that stuff. And, and usually we make sure that the software is flexible enough to meet our needs, not just now, but going on. So again, that's not something new. And I'm, I'm completely leery of doing a custom developed system because if you're really developing a, a PMS by yourself, uh, that's software development, that's expensive, that's complex. I mean, we're not a soft development. That's like saying we should design our own cars and build our own trucks and, and cell phones we shouldn't buy. We should design our own cell phones and build. You know, you get down that road and you end up, so we should as much as possible not do custom things, but instead buy something off the shelf since it's so generic. Mm -hmm. So. And, and let, let me clarify, that's, a, that's an excellent observation and a very good point. I think it's a misnomer in a way. So uh, what the out-of-the-box system is, like uh, Primavera or eBuilder, mm -hmm. when you bring it out, it has the acquisition module, it has the uh, standards module, it has the construction management module, mm -hmm. uh, invoice management module. Um, you flip a switch and you have all those modules ready. It's their workflow. It's the box that you wrap your hands around. Uh, and you take it all or you not take it you know, at all. It's a binary selection. And a lot of those systems, uh, the subscription base is each login would be $12,000 or $13,000 a year per login. So however many stakeholders you bring in into the system, that's what the subscription I was talking about. Um, the custom developed aspect, that's the misnomer I want to clarify. Um, it's like SharePoint, uh, for example. Uh, we can le leverage a current um, invoice management system if we have at SoCal to talk to another component of a SharePoint aspect. So we are doing the bridging of the data to make sure that the visibility is across those two systems. Um, what, I, what I refer to custom developed is to make sure that we collect the out of the box bits and pieces that we already have, but make them talk to each other and follow a certain workflow. That's what the custom was referring to. There, we are not doing the coding. We are not doing the custom develop in that uh, true sense, if, uh, if that makes sense. Okay. But you, you know, yeah, we are, not, we are not software developers either. Uh, we want to avoid that. Okay. Anyone in the public wishes to address us on this item? Can, can I just add a, a question out there as well, mm. just because I, Please do. I wasn't... I think that I think the task in itself, although it's called program management information system, the system part, the electronic user interface, um, the the SharePoint, which which right now what we're using with SharePoint, the district, as you know, we have Dropbox, and we have moved a lot of the stuff that we do with um, outside consultants to uh, a SharePoint site, but it, it's kind of right now just a, a generic Dropbox. We would help utilize some of these existing tools that are in SharePoint um, to, to project manage um, the community water plan. So I, you know, one of the things that Anoop and I talked about, it's not just, the, for, for what this effort is, it isn't just launching this interface, this, share, this enhanced SharePoint, it's development of a program schedule, a robust program schedule using Microsoft Projects, which isn't in here because we already have that license. Um, it's about meeting and doing some workshops um, with probably the, the standing committee or with staff and really identifying what are the key milestones of each of these things to better understand how they all interplay, not just with where a push pin is in terms of this is a this is a fun this is a funding opportunity. Do we want to go for the twenty million or forty million? This is what we need. This is all part of that, and I think that was um, maybe a little bit lost with the focus of the system. SharePoint system. But if you look at the tasks and you see the needs assessment, I I totally get what you're saying, um, President Daniels. We would identify what are the components right now that we really need to focus on because most of our programs under the community water plan are in a planning and evaluation and initiation phase. Um, but there are other components and hopefully we, this will have a life. It will at least have a life of five to seven years for the community water plan 
evaluation and implementation if it goes that far for projects to, to be built. But it also, I feel, um, and one of the reasons why we picked SharePoint is because it's a system already, it can, it can um, be phased in for CIP projects. The procurement, the design, the bid, the construction, the bid docs, and, and keeping all of that that we already do right now, um, but, but could be in this program. And I know that engineering may want to look at that. Um, and then again, I think because it was a, it was a great opportunity for us to be able to have this funded through the Prop 1 grant. It was really kind of a win-win for us to really try to, to wrap our hands around and leverage not just the Pure Water SoCal components, but all of the community water plan components within it. Okay, so uh, Bruce? So I, I think um, going back to Tom's initial question, you answered it, but I'd like our staff to answer it. You know, what does it look like with this versus just going staying the course that we're on now what what's the what's the difference I think I'll, I'll speak to it I'd love for you yeah to because I come from a, a, a perspective of getting to see it all go on I mean they all do but you know a little different uh, lens um, we're gonna make a mistake we've been lucky to go this far this long this hard without something to tie it all together without it's not just you know, it's not software development. It's like Anoop said, it, this is just pulling the systems together and so they can integrate a little bit. But it's also the expertise that, you know, they've been through this a couple times and uh, we rely heavily on that. Some of the, the pitfalls and the guidance that's provided. Um, so in a nutshell, I mean, we wouldn't bring it to you if we didn't think it provided our right. customers value. Uh, value, even even though it's provided by grant, we still wouldn't do that because we want to leverage the grant. I mean, we want the grant money to be put to the best use possible. But um, w I would say that uh, we're very liable to make a, uh, mistakes, probably more than one that would be much more costly than this. In short, and I don't think hiring. Uh, another staff person at this time is the way to go. We hired one for a two-year stint, seeing if that needed to be extended, so we have that option. Um, but that recruitment was hard. Yeah, that recruitment was hard. It's hard recruiting right now, but you don't get the bench that they're gonna bring. I mean, it's not just a noop up here. He's got, you know, he picks up the phone, he's got, I don't know how many people you got, but you got a lot of people you can call, and that's, the val that's also part of the value. And then, you talked about the horse before the cart, and again, to staff. With the Pure Water Soquel project, we we're in an EIR process. Mm -hmm. We have no project until that, um, in, until the EIR is, is evaluated and possibly certified. Right. So is this putting the, the cart before the horse? having this type of management? Are we gonna be doing things that um, are not necessary if we end up with no pure water soquel project? Or with no No, I'll, I'll take a crack at that again. No, I, I, I think um, it's a long road to get to an EIR, and, and we've got other uh, projects that we're evaluating too. So th it's, this, is, this is not the end of the road, this is the process part of the of the whole thing and that's what we're square in the midst to whether it's a, a EIR uh, uh, doing um, the stuff all the work that's going on now with uh, uh, the river exchange project there's a lot going on with stormwater it's it's not the end result it certainly can be used for construction management and that sort of thing but it's to get down the road seeing what combination what options are the best and uh, doing that in the most efficient way possible without um, making mistakes that cost time money or you know and people um, I know not anything about this SharePoint system that you talked about so I don't know what its capabilities are and its experience sounds like it's kind of certainly new to us um, but have we talked to other water agencies, particularly those that have bureau grants and have to do bureau reporting and have state grants and have to do state reporting and blah, 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 you know, something that we know, I mean, we, I don't know whether SharePoint is 
capable of doing what we're doing, but you know, we're going to stumble around and try and get, make it work. But maybe we could get experience from someone else who's already been there and done it and can tell us yeah. this works, this doesn't. Mm -hmm. no question. Yeah. And, and that, that's precisely the kind of uh, information. I just had one example of Lake Oswego Tigger, but what we would be doing is we'll be bringing a lot of the examples. As I mentioned, uh, every PMIS, very generic term, gets developed based on the needs of that agency uh, and their program. So we'll be bringing uh, four or five different options in that needs assessment workshop and then talk through different order what makes right sense for uh, SoCal, not just this program, but even long term as we talked about beyond the program. Uh, and from that, uh, we'll make a, a, a determination or help you make determination what's the right uh, solution. Okay, any other questions? Becky? And anyone else in the public? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I have a question. In reading this addendum to original scope of work, it says the $119,105 would be just to support this type of work through the end of the fiscal year. So that's what, two and a half months of work? And then it goes on, if approved in next year's budget, ongoing program management efforts will also be carried into the next year. So how much would that cost? I just, I just last night went to the Central Water District Board meeting and um, it's a stark contrast to what I see, quite frankly, what I see here. Um, I mean, they're putting in a new main system on Valencia and Ralph is out there directing traffic and Christine, their manager is on the tractor and they're working their absolute hearts out to do the best they can and keep the cost down for their ratepayers. And so I have a concern, I'm not a ratepayer, but I have a concern for them because I know many of them are on fixed incomes and it's already very difficult to pay their water bills having just had a 17.5% increase in rates. And I um, really question this, and I'm not questioning the abilities of your staff. I think your staff is great, and they work hard. And I've seen some terrific reports come up on the screen before you, and, and I really appreciate their hard work. Um, I just think this is a lot of money. And I also know that um, SB 623, which I have been told off on the side is going to happen because Governor Brown wants it to happen, um, that in the money that you have to collect from your ratepayers, there is money for administrative and reporting work, which I don't know if that's part of the future reporting that um, your consultant here is talking about. but. Um, I also just want to say that the Mid-County Groundwater Agency struggles with this too and they actually use the Regional Water Management Foundation locally. Mr. Tim Carson does all that and the County of Santa Cruz also does that. They have given over management of their complex grants to the Regional Water Management Foundation to help them manage. And so I would applaud your um, putting the brakes on this for now, at least until the end of the fiscal year, and really thinking about it and keep the cost of your water down for your ratepayers. Thank you. Okay. I'm, you know, I. I so think just, so to just, just, just a quick clarification yeah. on that comment. I think. Um, the work we are talking about for this fiscal year, it actually gets started in this fiscal year. It continues into the next fiscal year. So it's not just for this two months. It's the process that gets started and then continues forward. Uh, the idea was the needs assessment workshop and a couple of uh, staff input for what is the current status, what is the future status. All those meetings will happen in the next two months. But the integration of the system, implementation of the system, that will continue on throughout the program. Yeah, and I'll just reiterate, it, it, we always look through the customer lens, make no doubt about that, and it's also about the value. I mean, besides this being grant funded, federal um, state grant, uh, so no cost to our, our rate payers, uh, it's beyond that. It's, 
it, it again goes back to what is going to provide the best value to our customers and that and this is one of those tools again leading to protecting the aquifer and providing the best service so we wouldn't recommend it unless we thought it was doing that and i just um it's hard like maybe for me to just have this you know presented without some comparison alternatives of how we would manage things you know otherwise and I've asked the question and you've given a good answer and I understand you want to be efficient and um, we need to not make mistakes as we move forward on mm -hmm. all these important project possible projects and and so um, it's just it's, I'm just expressing I understand the, the need now better but I also do, but I don't feel like I really understand if this is the only all, only way to do it I share your uh, concerns. Well, th again, I'll, I'll just say there, there are many ways to attack it. We could go along with the way we're doing it, but I, I in my heart, feel that uh, we will make a mistake or either we'll lose people. Um, this is, I think, the most cost-effective approach to handling the complexity of what we got going on and keeping sanity um, uh, the whole bit. I mean... Well, partly I'm, I'm concerned about what we're buying into. I mean, the, the comments were right. I mean, task one is the needs analysis. I can see us funding that because we, we need to know what we're doing. And then implementation phase one. And there's no discussion about phase two or phase three. I mean, is that at the end? Or is are we buying ourselves into a multi-year, multi-zillion dollar? And to say that this is grant funded doesn't mean, you know, we forget about that because if we don't use that grant funded for this we'll be using it for something else that we need to do so right. um, right. so if and, I, and then ongoing program match so there's three tasks mentioned and yeah I think a new poll respond Go ahead. Right. so the, the reason why we talked or broke it up into implementation phase one or phase two or what may be phase three is right now where we are in the overall community uh, water plan we are into different options evaluation, what we would call a master planning phase. We don't have a set project that we are executing. There's no need for design standards or construction management um, module, so to speak, or workflow. When we do have a defined project that we are ready to construct, that's when we will talk about uh, implementation phase two, where we need to have a workflow around how do we manage design or coordinate design from multiple consultants who are working on the different aspects or construction management. Those might be later down the road. District doesn't need to spend money on those modules right now. What really the implementation phase, the immediate need might be to manage the schedule, to make sure that we are looking ahead and not missing uh, funding opportunities. So let me uh, talk about this aspect, getting a better handle on the overall schedule as it applies to EIR, as it applies to defining enough uh, project so that you can apply for WIFI, you, so you can apply for different uh, grants. I think that's the aspect we are talking about. Um, and, and that's what, you know, th think about the scenario over here on the funding opportunities. What is that deadline? What are the gaps? What does staff need to bring it in front of the board to make the decision and when? I think that's the phase one. That's the most critical need for the community water plan right now. And once the, the projects are selected, then we'll talk about design management, construction management, uh, procurement of the uh, contractors, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's the distinction between the two. Um, I think what has been uh, a little bit uh, confusing here is uh, this comes across as a heavy on the software solution, but really it's more about uh, program management support and staff augmentation. Um, that is what we are going forward. We are right now, along with the staff uh, augmentation, we're just setting up the framework that will enable you to make the decision. Earlier today, uh, the discussion was river water transfer. We want to have the water available by December of next year or winter of next year. Well, how is that going to be possible? We need to have the systems in place, the background framework, that as soon as that is possible, we are able to execute those projects or be ready. So that's all we are uh, talking about. I have one comment after you. Well, I'm, I'm looking at 
task 1.2 and I see $57,000 not to exceed amount has been used for implementing PMI, PMIS functionalities on SharePoint platform in phase one. And I don't think it's um, until we do the needs analysis, we don't know what functionalities we need. And I think until we do some investigation, we're not even sure that SharePoint is the right platform to build it on in the first place. So we're, I think the thing I would like to see do is just task 1.1. Let's do the needs analysis. Let's get some idea of what functionality we need. Let's also do some research and figure out what platform is the right platform to build this on. And then we'll know what task 1.2 should be. And I mean, rather than jumping into $112,000 right off the bat, uh, when, I mean, so this is clearly just a wild ass guess of how much to spend on phase two. You're right. Um, be it, it is, and I think it was. It's not. I wouldn't say it's a wild ass, ass guess, but I do think that what it says here is correct. We did not know what we would need. So for but it says for budgeting purposes, it was allocated to be a not to exceed. And typically with our consultant contracts, we only pay for what we decide on. And so part of the efforts is the needs assessment workshop. Anoop and his team, we're gonna meet with, with staff and the stakeholders, identify what was the best platform for us to use, recommend that, and then we would we would implement that. Uh, if so it's too fast and the board it would like to be part of that for us to come back, I, I'm, I'm fine with, with that. So you'd be fine with a motion to approve phase uh, two, I would, 1 1 then. I would say if we wanted to do it in that phased approach, I would like I would like to do task 1.1 with some 1.3 because I do feel that there's a lot of um, information gathering, um, especially on some of the other components. BC has has a lot of knowledge on the Pure Water Soquel. We need a little bit more knowledge uh, efforts to be to be garnered from the other community water plan components so that they can do that kind of assessment and build that schedule. And President Daniels, if I may, that was precisely the thought process we were into, is we wanted to provide some tangible outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, when we just do the needs assessment, we were f uh, foreseeing a question about what does all that do? What is the next phase? What do you do with that information? Mm -hmm. And we used uh, some of the recently completed project and looked at what is the worst case scenario in terms of impl if we wanted to, uh, let's say, implement schedule module and the decision making module what would that cost be? And that's where the, that assumption comes in. But you're absolutely right. I think the first phase is to do the needs assessment, provide some staff support. We wanted to give you something more tangible. You know, what does that actual end product look like? Um, Tom? Yeah, I just yeah. want to see if I'm assessing the situation correctly. And I like, I, I actually, uh, we're kind of, we all like, I think pretty much that idea of like a stepwise thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm hearing you correctly, and I'm like we've had other projects managed by other consultants, like getting a well done at the polo fields and so forth, like that, managing where our staff. I think we have an amazing staff, but I I just get this feeling. And tell me if I'm not correct that you're putting in a lot of extra hours to keep things rolling as well as they are but that that can't go on forever trying to manage all these things and be realistic. I, I think that's correct. I also think it is uh, we're starting to enter a dimension as good as our staff is, and they are good. Uh, the knowledge, we need out, some outside knowledge. The, the district, our customers will benefit on a cost per dollar spent by the experience brought in from them right. and support. And so my, my last question would be then, if we were just wanted to do like 1.1 1 .1 and 1.3, what would be an amount not to exceed for some project management and- There are numbers for all three phases. Yeah. So, we could just so 30 plus the third one's more it's 30, amorphous, it's 30,000. 30, yeah. 30 plus, what's 1.1? 1. 1. Okay. The first one's 31, so it'd okay. be 61,000. Okay. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, so. Part, part of what's difficult about this is that we don't know what the next steps are going to be. Um, nobody does. And part of it, we don't know how much help we're going to need in the future, too. It would help me to have information about that to, to 
you know, decide how far to go along the road. Don't want to go partway along the road and be, you know, not know what's coming up ahead. So I, I hear very clearly that our staff is telling us that um, they need help with this, that, that it's going to be good for our customers if, if, we, uh, if we get the help. And I'm supportive of it, but I'd like, you know, I'd like to see a roadmap as part of that need assessment as much as possible. And part of that roadmap is just the cost involved. And I'd like to see alternatives as well. That's been brought up so several times. So when this need assessment, you know, ha happens, you know, what's the direction to go that's that we think is the preferred direction and what are these other possible directions to go. And that would help me decide how far to go along this road. Because I'm, I'm right now I'm thinking about a review that I did on this uh, for a project. I was asked to do a review of a project and uh, <clears throat> on whether it should be funded or not. And I thought it was a fantastic project, but it was, I, I, want, I told the people who were gonna fund it that it's going to cost five to ten times more um, than what they're asking for if it's done, you know, if it goes the, the way that it's going to go. And I want to know that type of information mm -hmm. on the advantages with going, you know, with the consultant route and, and what the other possibilities are. So I think that's similar to, to, what, to what I've heard. Are you the same? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm generally supportive. I've been, uh, yeah, I've been in the, the position of having to sort out all kinds of deadlines and funding and budgeting and things like that, and mesh it all together and make sure you don't miss a key point. And so I'm really sympathetic to that. And I, but I just don't know whether this is even enough <laughs> mm -hmm. to do that if it's what you need. Um, so I would be in favor of. Imp implementing phase one and then 1.3 if that's okay. feel strongly about that and mm. and then just play it by ear on the back. all right two. so so if if and I, and I think as well we need to not just do a needs analysis we need to do a, a resource analysis mm -hmm. I mean I don't imagine SharePoint has a thing in there to do a reporting for uh, the bureau grants mm -hmm. but there might be some software out there that already does that yeah, and, and, and Monterey might know that, and, and consulting help, that. And, and that sort of thing. So that that has been in the works in the background. We just okay. we're, we're bringing it to you one step at a time. But so, oh, go ahead. No, no, I think you're gonna we're gonna I say think the same they, thing. Yeah, we've all also been in the position of getting s stuck with a, p a bunch of software that we could it couldn't uh, make useful. In the yeah, I think the software thing, we overplayed that and maybe misrepresented that in the memo. It really is. That's a, that's a part of it. That's just like the, the basic skeleton. We're talking framing uh, our, you know, the, the outside structure of the house, the windows and that sort of thing and um, the flooring. But here we just need that the software is just a minor part of that. It's just like the, the, the pony wall on a house. Um, it's the experience of the builders coming in. So, it, I mean, I can, I can, it's, it's getting close to nine. So a, am I correct in hearing the board is interested in, in us pursuing 1.1 1 .1 and 1.3 and then seeing where that evolves? And if a board member wants to be part of that, I think that would be awesome. Uh, but we, we would, is that what I'm hearing? I, I was, I could, let me see if I can okay. frame it as a motion. Good. That we, that we do proceed with 1.1 and 1.3 with an uh, amount not to exceed 61,000, whatever. The, cover it. Okay, 62,000. Um, with a report back to the board, entire board mm -hmm. at that point so that we can see where that's gone and what the options are for the next steps. Great, right. I'll that was a motion. Oh yeah, I'll second it. Okay, Great. we have a motion, we have Thank a second. You. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And thank you, staff. Yeah. Uh, it's almost here. Yeah. It's getting late. Yep. Item 6.4, board direction regarding meeting officials uh, in which, Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> this is yours, Ron. Yep. Yep. So in that vein of uh, trying to do right by our customers and 
uh, obtain grant funding for the community water plan. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned earlier, and it's noted in the memo, we've been successful. Uh, you know, dollar invested has yielded uh, multiple dollars in return, and the future looks even brighter. That's on the state level, and we've had some success on the federal level. You know, they, they uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, showed, you know, a sign of faith with $150,000 grant for the feasibility study, um, saying, hey, uh, change your state's feasibility study. So it's, um, it resonates with the Bureau in terms of grant funding, and, and we did that, and it was just accepted, as uh, Melanie mentioned. Uh, However, that's just the first step. And we've met with the staff up in um, Sacramento, the bureau staff. They gave us very poignant uh, direction on what we need to, to do to go further. We've had a previous bureau grant way back, so we've had some experience with them. I administered that grant. Um, it was on the conservation side of things, but still it gave us a lot of insight to them. And basically, what we think would yield the best value is uh, going to D.C., and this is not just coming from us, but various uh, input from bureau staff and others, uh, go to D.C., uh, meet with various representatives there. We have uh, a person there that will help us with that. And then uh, I'd like to actually make a uh, addendum to this uh, motion here potentially not only D.C., but look at stopping in Denver on the way back if that's feasible because the people who actually administer the gra uh, grants uh, usually and make some of the large decisions, I say not minister, but make some of the, the major decisions on that are located in Denver for the Bureau of Rec. Uh, so if we can arrange that, we'd like to stop on the way back and do that too and meet with them, give them a greater understanding of, of the various uh, projects that we have going on being evaluated in the community water plan. So um, the the, uh, ten, uh, the timing and the logistics is there. What we're asking for tonight is if um, up to two board members would be interested uh, in, if you want to do this, go approve this item, going back to D.C. with probably two members of staff, uh, maybe another person also we'll have to see, uh, maybe a, a member of... Um, uh, one of our partner agencies also uh, express interest today and uh, meet with those officials and then potentially stop back in D.C. and, and I mean in, in Denver and then come back here. So we're asking for approval of that of that and then also uh, direction on two board members up to two board members if they might be interested in, in going with us. And at the agenda review this week both Tom and myself expressed interest in going, which I think might be effective, but if the others want to put their names forward, we can talk about all that. Um, I, I see the value in it. Unfortunately, my schedule doesn't allow me to go. Okay. Does your schedule allow you to go, and do you? Uh, yeah, it depends on what it is, obviously. But, hmm. uh, I could attest to the efficacy of this. I did run it, I ran into it and had a long conversation with a woman who's uh, uh, worked with some small coastal, southern coastal water systems uh, south of us, but central, and that they needed a water project and they needed to go, that's what they did. They just started, but it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't accomplish what they needed in one visit, though, I have to warn you, it took them about three visits. No, and, and that's a great point. Thank you, um, Director <laughs> Christensen. We, we and it did work. It did right. work at the establishing the connection, actually making, t being able to make the case in person mm -hmm. uh, was very effective. Yeah. I know PVWMA did the same thing. They, yeah. They had multiple trips with multiple people going back east. Right. And yeah. In a case, and they got about 25 million over numerous years. So y you're right. It, it, we and I and I, sh I, I 49 million. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, a large sum that was beneficial. Um, but this isn't a one and done. I would envision at least one other trip, probably one other trip, in, uh, uh, roughly a year later. So uh, there'd be opportunities to you know to go again, um, and I think it would be necessary actually. So sometimes if you get shut out, you know. Well, we tried, but 
don't no need to go back next year. Right, right. And to, we can play it by ear, but the they the direction we got, they kind of laid it out, and they said, okay, this is two trips, one now, one basically a year later, and in between, um, if you can get to Denver, that's that's a benefit too. And this is yeah, their people. And it's, and it's work, especially as we go into Washington, D.C. in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's pretty intense heat there. So the way it would work is if you designate two people who want to go with us, what we would do then immediately tomorrow, uh, Probably Karen would sit, could send out a doodle poll on the best times. I've laid out some dates that are not uh, we're, beneficial. We're not good. <laughs> or not good. And then um, we would get the ball rolling. Well, personally, I think they would most appreciate the president and vice president going because that's something that they, they don't know who we are, but that's the title that could impress. So I'm good. Ever? <laughs> it's fine. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, I I see it. I see the advantage with that. Uh, and I think perhaps um, if there's a follow-up trip, having different people. Sure. Absolutely. There could be an advantage to that as well. Yeah, get to meet the whole crew, and, and maybe even a backup if if if, right. if I get if Carla is willing to just on this trip in case something happens or a schedule doesn't work, that would be good because this is going to be that's a, what I was going to say in the yes. time frame might be a little um, challenging logistically. Are you willing to be a backup? Oh yeah, and possibly Rochelle too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll make the motion. Um, sure, go ahead. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks for speaking up. <laughs> kind of getting carried away. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go to D.C. too. <laughs> um, Becky yeah. Steinbrenner. Not all it's my Didn't problem. your district hire a consultant to speak on your behalf in Washington, D.C.? Wasn't it like $45,000 a contract for a consultant in Washington, D.C.? Where are they? Why can't they do this for you? And what about Skype? What I, I mean, I, I see the value in, in going to places when there are projects you really need to see that are working and question the technical aspects of. But if it's just going to basically glad hand somebody, I think, um, I think we need to look at more cost effective ways, such as Skype. I think we need to look at um, things that are just as effective and don't use, um, <coughs> don't spew out greenhouse gases and uh, are real savings to your ratepayers. So um, that's, that's my take on this. I'm not one of your ratepayers, but again, I see this is a big expense and you've already hired consultants in Washington, D.C., as I understood it, to do this very kind of work. Thank you. Can I address this? Or sure. Ron, do you want to address it? No, go for it. I just, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm only going on the advice of others that this is an effective way. I don't, I don't really want to go to Washington, D.C., personally. I, I, I want to go if it's effective to get funds for the district so that the ratepayers don't have to pay as much. And it was exactly the consultant that we hired in Washington who's suggesting this is the thing you need to do. So yeah, among others. We've had, um, we've consulted with various um, mm -hmm. people who've obtained grants, people who provide grants, yeah. uh, these grants, so. And it's our Washington representative who's yes. kind of set this up and arranged the yeah. actual meetings and, and go along with us. But right. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll second it. Well, <laughs> I've made <yeah>. a motion. <laughs> <laughs> so made to, a motion to approve two directors and staff to meet with federal representatives in Washington D.C. and in Denver, if that can be arranged, in the same trip, and the the president and vice president being the first. Uh, being the directors to go 
and Carly being the backup, an alternate. Yeah. Okay. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think that's unanimous. Okay, we go to 6.5. Well, I'm going to make it a little easy on the board tonight at this late hour. Um, as the memo is presented uh, by the Human Resources Office um, on uh, a district organizational and staffing review of the operations unit in the um, O&M department, the memo is presented actually has recommendations for um, s s motions and I am going to indicate that I'm going to pull my recommendation for board action tonight. This will be an informational item only. So you don't have to make any decisions tonight on this one. Um, but I, I do want to provide this information to the board um, because I will be bringing it back. We wanted to make sure that we had adequate time for our uh, staff groups, um, our employee groups to um, take a look at this information and be able to um, have an opportunity to it's discuss that with staff. Hour, it's that you want yeah. to, okay. Uh, yes. So uh, with this late hour, uh, um, just a quick overview of this informational item. Um, the Human Resources Department did conduct an organizational and staffing review, um, specifically a classification study of the equipment mechanic position within the district. Um, the last time that this job description had been uh, revised was in 2005. Obviously, we needed to make some updates to that specific job description. Um, we also did a, um, a, a deep study, actually the, the study, um, the classification study for the equipment mechanic was initiated even before I got to the district four years ago. Um, the the uh, study was initiated, it was shelved, it was brought back. We took a long time looking at the equipment mechanic position because there was a lot of detail um, and some changes that had gone on with that. And as a result of that study, we made the determination that the district really does have um, a need to maintain the equipment mechanic as part of its classification plan. Um, but we, in recognition of actually what's been happening over a period of time and some gradual changes in the position held by the current equipment mechanic, it was determined that um, a secondary classification within the job class family of mechanic, of equipment utilities mechanic, really warranted consideration. And so you see that new um, job description proposed uh, within the memo of equipment utilities mechanic. That position really um, has evolved over time to not only manage our um, fleet of equipment and uh, district vehicles, but um, our current equipment mechanic, Dave Patton, really does spend a lot of his time in working on our um, some of our distribution uh, system components, including our pumps. Um, he really is has become an expert in generators, and we have grown our um, fleet of generators. And he actually has um, has kind of full scope responsibility for some doing some of the load testing of the the generators to make sure that they're available for us when we need them. Um, uh, and and. So with that, uh, in recognition of the work that he's been doing, um, we are proposing to create a new job classification of the equipment utilities mechanic um, and maintain the um, existing equipment mechanic. We are proposing that um, the uh, current incumbent, Dave Patton, be promoted into that new classification um, as equipment utilities mechanic. We also took a look at the structure of the, um, the reporting structure of that particular position in recognition through that classification study that so much of Dave's work right now actually um, is working very closely with our operations supervisor. Um, right now, the equipment mechanic is a direct report to the operations and maintenance manager. Um, and so through that process, we really kind of took a, a hard look at that reporting structure, also in light of the fact that we have a pending retirement in the operations supervisor position. Um, we recognize that maybe now would be the opportune time to make some changes to the operations supervisor position um, in regards to the equipment mechanic classification and the, um, the, uh, the reporting structure of that. 
um, to prepare ourselves for recruitment. We didn't want to make a bunch of changes to a job description and then maybe change them in a, in a couple, three months when we're ready to um, start a recruitment. So um, we are proposing some changes to the operations supervisor job classification in the mid-management -manage unit as well. Um, through that process, we um, looked at certifications um, and recognized that right now our, um, the, the we have two supervisors in the operations and management department. We have our field crew supervisor and we have our operations supervisor. Um, we recognize that there's an inconsistency in the distribution certification for both of those supervisors, which didn't really make sense to us in the analysis process. And so we're looking at uh, providing equity to that certification for both of those supervisors. So that's the information that's presented and it will come back to the board Um, the reason you want to maintain the the original equipment mechanic yes is probably because I'm guessing because when this employee retires you might be able to you might need to just hire a mechanic that doesn't necessarily have those skills yeah um, it, it's presented in the memo um, the equipment mechanic okay. actually would create a level if need be um, in the future if we needed to recruit um, our as we know our, our fleet is 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 expanding, our equipment is expanding, our distribution system is expanding in order to meet, meet the needs of the district. Um, and so if we have the need in the future to recruit, that provides that job family movement, a bigger pool of, of recruiting uh, recruitment candidates more than likely would be at the equipment mechanic level. And just as we've seen with our own employee, um, the growth within that um, knowledge and skill in our utility um, could be served by having that uh, higher level position um, to grow into. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Public? Seeing none, okay. We just have one more item, which is a written communication, item 7.1. Yeah, this was just sent to staff. We wanted to present it. Um, this person has written several times about the same subject of stormwater, and I believe we've responded, letting them know that um, that we are pursuing that. It's one of our okay. portfolio projects. Good. If you want us to respond again, we'll be glad to. Otherwise, already done that. No need to do it again. Okay. I would say. Okay, so we're done with that, and then we will Not go rocket to. Rocket science. <laughs> we will go to a closed session with two items. Items 8.1 and 8.2.